Welcome back. This video is going to be the most complete beginner's guide for Elder Scrolls Online that has ever been made. By the time you finish this video, you will understand every system in ESO and will be able to navigate the game with confidence. I suggest listening to this while you play and using the timestamps to revisit any topic that you need to come back to later. As always, please leave a comment and I'll do my best to respond to every single one. Don't believe me? Try it out. Without wasting any more time, let's dive straight in. All right, let's talk about character creation. When you buy Elder Scrolls Online, it will by default allow you to have eight character slots. If you have a version of the game that includes the Elsewhere expansion, then you will be able to create nine characters. You can also purchase an additional nine character slots, allowing you to have up to 18 character slots total. Elder Scrolls Online is definitely a game that lends itself to having lots of alts. You create a character, you do a lot of stuff on that character, and then you can create an alt and do it all over again, but on a different class. And you can repeat quests, or you can also take advantage of being able to do dailies more than once. So if you have two characters, then you can do daily at least two times per day, which can be very beneficial to your character in terms of, you know, maybe doing the dailies in certain DLC zones. And at the end of those dailies, you have a chance to get a cosmetic. Well, if you're doing those dailies on three characters, you're three times as likely to get the cosmetic that you're trying to get. But the best part of ESO is you only have to level alts up to 50. After 50, your characters share champion points. These are an account wide level. So right now there's a total of 3,600 account wide levels called champion points that you can earn. Only about 1,300 of those are actually actually effective champion points. Everything beyond that is kind of alternate loadout options. You can only use about 1300, 1400 of them at a time. And that might sound like a massive number. And it kind of is. It's a little bit of a grind, certainly getting all the way up to 1400. But fortunately for you, someone that's just starting the game now, they greatly expedited the pace at which you get champion points. So you earn champion points right now three times as fast as you used to. So your levels are going to fly. The first dungeon you do could give you as many as 50 champion points. So because champion points are account wide, you only have to get a character to 50, which you can do in as little time as a day. So if you're the type of person that's going to want to jump from a necromancer to a Templar to a Dragon Knight and then to a sorcerer, then go ahead and play lots of characters. Or if you're the type of person that just wants to play one character all day, every day, there's nothing wrong with doing that either. It's not going to hold you back. Now let's go over the act of actually creating your character. The character creation process can be a little bit confusing, especially for a brand new player because of the three alliances that the game has has to offer. Right now, the game has three alliances and 10 races. So you've got the Daggerfall Covenant, which means you would either be a Breton, an Orc, or Redguard. If you create an Aldemary Dominion character, it's going to be either High Elf, Wood Elf, or Khajiit. And if you create an Ebonheart Pact character, it's going to be Argonian, Dark Elf, or Nord. Elder Scrolls Online is a massive and complicated game. The quantity and the depth of the choices available to you are a large part of why you'll be able to play ESO for months and even years. Similarly, Rise of Kingdoms also has an insane amount of depth and customization for you while you're building your kingdom. Rise of Kingdoms is the sponsor of today's video, and it features a massive technology tree based on real life history. Choose a path in your military tree that lets you train elite soldiers like British longbows, or go for German Teutonic Knights instead. You can also improve your soldiers by unlocking upgrades like stirrups for a more offensive cavalry, or you can upgrade your archers and place them defensively. You can even work together with your allies to find territory secrets that give even your low-ranking soldiers elite powers. You can play Rise of Kingdoms on your phone or on your PC with full drag and click RTS controls. Rise of Kingdoms features 13 different civilizations, each with their own historical leaders, architectural styles, military units, and more. Take your army into battle with friends and participate in alliance fights as big as 30 vs 30. Customize your city's layout and appearance to make it look amazing while also being a military juggernaut. Your base will exist in a seamless world map that you can zoom in and out of to see other players and barbarian outposts, as well as natural landmarks like rivers, mountain ranges, and strategic passes that you can capture to gain entrance into neighboring regions. Choose from historical figures like Julius Caesar, Sun Tzu, or Joan of Arc and level them up by defeating barbarians and winning battles. Further upgrade your commander by choosing abilities in an RPG style, talent tree, and skill system. Support my channel by downloading Rise of Kingdoms from the link in the description below or or using the QR code on screen right now and receive a special bonus by using the code ROKTECHPOW. Technology is power. Build your powerful kingdom in Rise of Kingdoms. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the video. Now, you'll notice if you pick a race, it's automatically going to change your alliance. By default, these races are bound to these alliances. Now, these alliances, these factions, only matter when it comes to very specific aspects of the game, which is PvP. So in Cyrodiil, you 
will only be able to fight with other Ebonheart Pact members when you're Ebonheart Pact. And when you're in Imperial City Sewers, you'll only be able to fight with other Ebonheart Pact members when you're Ebonheart Pact. In the Battlegrounds, it doesn't matter. Factions don't matter there. So it's literally two pieces of the game, two very small pieces of the game compared to the rest. And this is only going to affect people that are going to seek out PvP. So if you're starting the game with a friend and you guys want to PvP, then make sure you both pick the same alliance. That's going to be important for you. If you guys aren't going to be getting into PvP, then your alliance doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Pick the race that you're excited about. There is a third option. There is a DLC pack that you can buy called any race, any alliance. You can buy this in the crown store. This is one of the first DLCs a lot of people purchase, and this is going to allow you to mix and match races and alliances. So you would be able to create an orc that was on the Ebonheart pack. You can choose these two things independently that way. The game also offers the option to change your alliance after you've made your character. So if you already made your character and your friend already made their character and someday you decide you want to get into PVP, but you're on the wrong alliance or they are, you can buy an alliance change token from the cash shop and change your alliance. So these things, your race can be changed with cash shop transaction. Your alliance can be changed with the rec cash shop transaction. These are things that you can fix at a later date. These are not things that will break your character if you change your mind down the road. It's just going to cost you a little bit of money to do that. Now, once you've chosen your race, let's go ahead and go with a Breton here. You can either randomize your appearance here and, you know, hope it picks something decent or ridiculous for you, depending on what kind of look you're going for. Or we could go with female. Same thing. We could randomize here. And this is a good way to see the wide range of options that you can eventually have and we can go ahead and fine tune this look. So let's say we were going to go with this girl right here. And the first thing you could pick is let's say you wanted to be choosing your class. You can choose Dragonite, Sorcerer, Nightblade, Templar, Warden, or Necromancer. These are the six classes in Elder Scrolls Online. The Warden and the Necromancer were the first two DLC classes added to the game and currently the only two DLC classes added to the game. So the first four are the base game classes. These two are purchased separately. The Dragonite deals with a lot of poison and fire. The Sorcerer deals with a lot of lightning and wind. The Nightblade deals with like shadow magic and blood magic and stealth. The Templar deals with lights and sunlight and that type of damage. The Warden is more of a nature slash summoner kind of class you have animal companions like a bear and earth magic like trees and flowers and things like that and then there's the necromancer who raises the dead and has a lot of undead magic and stuff like that uh all of these classes are viable all of these classes can do all content in the game there is no class that is the wrong choice if you're ever curious which class is currently the best just look for one of my uh which class is best this patch guides on my youtube channel i usually put a couple of these out every year just to make sure that they're always up to date for you guys. I also have class tier lists on my website. I'll put links to these things down in the description below so that you guys don't have to go hunting around YouTube or the internet forum. Uh, but just know that those are there in case you want to know which class is the best right now. But I would urge you not to make your decision based on that because it does change every three months or so. They're always rebalancing the game. The best class this patch is almost certainly not going to be the best class next patch, right? But the best is never far from the worst. And so you're going to be fine with no matter what you choose. Choose something that excites you. Choose something that aesthetically looks cool to you, whether it's poison and fire or shadow and blood, right? Pick what you're excited about. After your class, you can choose to alter your appearance. You can choose to make your character large or thin, muscular. It's up to you or somewhere in the middle. You can change their heights, you can change their skin color, you can change body markings. You can change torso sizes, right? It's got everything that you would normally like to change in these types of games. It's got chest slider. It's got a posterior slider. And what else does it have? Foot, leg, right? It's got just about everything that you could possibly want for sure. It's one of the most involved character creators in the MMOs that are out right now. You can change your voice. And again, on your face, you can make it soft, angular, or heroic, and hairstyles you can mess around with. You can, there's an age slider. You can definitely make them look older if you'd like to, you know whatever you're into. And uh, if you don't know, feel free to just hit that randomize slider until it gets close to something and then you can fine tune it from there. I do that a lot when I'm making my alts. I made like 15, 16, 17, 18 characters by now. And if I don't start by randomizing something, 
I always end up with a character that looks the same as all my other characters. So I usually start by randomizing until it ends up with something that looks kind of cool to me. And then I'll go in and fine tune it from there. Once you've settled on a look for your character, you can go ahead and name it. All right. And then create. And you'll be given the option to play through the tutorial or skip the tutorial. It doesn't matter which one you choose. If you play through the tutorial, it's going to eventually drop you into a room that lets you pick a portal that takes you to any expansion the game has come out with so far. If you choose to skip the tutorial, it's going to put you in the newest expansion that you own. So if you own High Isle, it's going to drop you at the beginning of the High Isle story. Whether or not you do the tutorial, you can start in any zone that you want. For this video, I'm going to go ahead and skip the tutorial just to show you what happens when you get into the game and what you can do from there. All right, like I said, so so since I own High Isle, it's dropped me in High Isle right in front of Jakarn here. And the marker over his head, that is an important marker. That is a main story quest marker, or in this case, a zone story quest. So every zone in the game has a zone story attached to it. So if you go into that zone over here on the left, you'll be able to see what percent of the map you've finished and how many of the quests you've done or how much of the zone story. Cyrodiil is a PVP zone, so it's only got one zone story. It doesn't have a lot of PVE. It has a ton of PVP though. If we go to Lenumbra, you can see here zero out of 24 of the zone story quests completed. So you can always open this up and look over here and see what you have and what you don't have done. Right off the bat, you can teleport to any expansion zone in the game. So if you want to go to Somerset or if you you want to go to elsewhere or southern elsewhere, northern elsewhere, any DLC zone that's come out, there will be a shrine for you to get to it. So like I said, it doesn't really matter if you do the tutorial or not. You'll be able to choose where you go from there. You've got two options when you load into the game. You can either do the game in order. I'll put a link to how to do the game in order because the game doesn't make you do it in order. It just drops you in like this. We're here. We're in this zone and it says, OK, go do what you want to do. Literally, that's it. You can go do whatever you want to do from this point. If you want to experience the game in the order that it was written in the order that it was made, then use the link down in the description below. And that's going to teach you how to do this game in order. Otherwise, just pick a zone that looks cool to you. If you don't want to do the base game, then I would start with Vardenfell and go from Vardenfell to the Clockwork City to Somerset. That's the best story arc in the game by far. But it's made all the better if you do the preceding content, because once upon a time, there was a story order that you had to play the game in. Zoss just removed that and made the whole game all one level. So once you land in the game, you're going to spawn right in front of an NPC like this one. He's going to have this marker over it. That is the zone story marker. There's a few different types of quests in this game. There's daily quests, which are going to have a blue marker above the NPC's head. That means you can redo those every single day. There's going to be little up arrows, like little white or black up arrows. Those are just one time quests that you can do. And then there's going to be this quest marker. It's more of a diamond shape, you know, a little more frill to it. And this is a zone story quest. This means that up here you can see Anytime you're in a zone, it'll tell you how many zone story quests there are in that zone. And this is the story for that zone. It's a compartmentalized story that starts and ends in that zone. And you get the, it's like a little mini story for the game. And every single zone in the game has its own compartmentalized story that you can play through. Now, you've got two options when you spawn in the game. You can either play through the game as it was made and as it was intended in its original design, which is going to start you on one of these little islands over here. And then you're going to go to like another one and then you'll go through the zones. Like, for instance, if you started in Daggerfall Covenant anyway, if you were an EP, you'd start over here, play through these zones. And if you're ADA, then you would start over here and on these little islands and then go up into the mainland here this way, right? So it kind of depends which faction you choose. There's a different order of the zones for every faction. And then after you get through your faction story, you would go into the expansion zones. Now you can do the game in order. I'll give you a link in the description below if you want to do that, because the game doesn't tell you how to do it in order. It just drops you into the game like it has for me right now in the newest zone that you own. Uh, so, you know, which can be a little bit uh, disorienting for new players. They're like, oh, this is where the game starts. But really, you just got dropped into the newest expansion that you own, which is absolutely absolutely not where the game starts, but it is its own story. So it would be OK if you did that first. But if you want to do it in order, check out the link in the description below. I'll put that there. It's a written guide that you can have open and on hand, and it'll basically just tell you, you know, uh, which order to go to each zone and do that zone story. So you'd go to this zone and you do this zone story. Then you go to this zone and do that zone story. Right. And so on and so forth. And, you know, it just if you're the type of person that's really into Elder Scrolls lore or really going to be into the story, then I kind of recommend doing the game in order. But also I have a character
character creation guide. I'll also link that. That's going to be really useful for there's a few things I would do out of order also like picking up all of the expansion features that have been added. There's been new skill lines, companions and things like this that have been added over the years. And rather than level up without them, I would go grab those without doing those zone stories that they're in. Just go to the zone, pick the thing up and then leave and start at the beginning of the story with all of those extra features enabled on your account. Now, if that's a little bit confusing to you, don't worry. There's a video for that. It's in the description as well. I've linked it. The cool thing about these zone story quests is that if you finish the entire zone story for a zone, you're going to get about three skill points. This is a decent way to get extra skill points on your character. You're going to use these skill points to choose skills that you want. So if I want flame school, I have one skill point. Boom. I click, I unlock it, and now I can slot it on my bar. Now I have zero skill points, right? So these cost skill points. You need skill points for these. And one way to get those is by doing zone story quests. Another way to get these is by just simply running around the map and collecting sky shards, which is a lot faster way to get skill points. Every three sky shards is going to give you a skill point. So that's the different types of quests you can do and the order that you can do the game in. You can either do it in any order that you want. You know, if this zone's beautiful and you just want to start in high aisle because it's pretty, it looks fun, go for it. If you want to do the game in order so you better understand the story and the characters that you meet along the way, well, then I've got a written guide linked in the description that'll help you with that as well. All right, the next thing that we're going to talk about is death and consequences. What happens when you die in Elder Scrolls Online? So we're going to go ahead and let our character die here. All right, so we've died. So what does this actually mean? Well, you've got a few options. You can see here at the bottom of the screen, it says you can res here and use a soul gem. You could also res at a way shrine if you don't have a soul gem, or maybe that's just where you want to be anyway. So if you choose the way shrine option, it's just going to take you to the nearest way shrine, which is not far away from me right now. That would be something I could do, or I could use the gem to resume my battle with this enemy and get revenge on it. Soul gems have a couple of uses in Elder Scrolls Online, one of which is resing yourself when you die, uh, and another is resing your team teammates when they die. So in dungeons and in trials, like if you're in combat, you can't res yourself. Someone has to res you until you get out of combat. Then you could res yourself and you would need a soul gem to res yourself. Likewise, if one of your teammates dies, they need you to res them and you'll need a soul gem on you in order to res them. So you always want to have a nice chunky stack of these on you. You're almost always going to have way more than you need. I usually get uh, excess. I'll have multiple stacks of 200 and I always sell the excess. I never carry more than 200 on me. So anytime I have a stack of 200 and then a stack of 20, I'll go sell the stack of 200. It's about 6,000 gold, which is actually a really nice income. Uh, just checking these things when you have access. It's a good bit of money to help you get going early on. Empty soul gems will turn into filled soul gems kind of naturally while you're playing the game. So just know that you need some of these, but enemies will drop both soul gems and filled soul gems. So in this example, let's go ahead and res in place. We're going to use one of my soul gems. And what's going to happen is you're going to be ethereal. You'll be a little ghost real quick and you'll be invulnerable to damage. You can kind of sort yourself out, move yourself away from the enemy and get your composure again. And then after a few moments, boom, you're back and you could go and fight that enemy. Another use for soul gems is your enchants on your weapons. Weapons have enchants that you have to maintain their charge on. And the way you charge them is by using one of your soul gems. So right here at the top of this, you see that little blue bar and it's filled up. It's like 90% full, right? There's a little gap on the left and the right side. I can right click this item and then click charge and then choose the soul gem and it's going to fill that back up. Now, if we look at it, the blue bar is completely full. If your charge goes all the way to zero, then your enchant stops working this weapon's firing chant right so it'll occasionally do 2838 flame damage to my enemy that is because of the charge on the weapon so you always want to keep your weapons charge on and you do that by using a soul gem so when your charge gets to zero don't worry you don't have to buy a new item and like i said you're gonna have way more soul gems than you need so when you use these to charge your weapon it's not a big deal okay next up let's go over the user interface mine might look just a little bit different than yours because i am using some add-ons whereas you probably don't have add-ons installed yet the first thing that's worth knowing is you've got your chat box here. You can grab the chat by the word chat and you can drag that anywhere you want. You can reshape it by grabbing the corner and make it any size you want. It's totally up to you. You can hit the period on your keyboard and this will bring up a cursor, which will allow you to grab things and move them around. Some stuff can be moved without an add on and some stuff will need an add on in order to be moved. If you want to move your skill bars or your health bars around, you're going to need an add on to move those things presently. At the top, you have a compass here and that compass is going to tell you where your objectives are. If you have a quest, you'll be able to find your quests on there. If there's a shrine nearby, it'll show you the shrine. If there's a point of interest, that'll be on there as well. And so you can use your compass much like you could in, say, Skyrim to navigate the world. Uh, ESO does not come with a mini map. My mini map is available because I have an add on installed 
installed if you're on console unfortunately you will not have a minimap and if you're on pc you will not start with one unless you install an add-on that allows you to have one which you know i will link my add-ons guide i think there are some incredible add-ons that have been made for elder scrolls online the minimap is just one of them so if you if that sounds like something that would be nice to have, be sure to check out my add ons guide. I'll link that down in the description below down here at the bottom of the screen. You'll see your skills. Typically, you'll only see one bar at a time. So you've got two bars of skills in ESO. We call them the front bar, which is going to be your top weapon here. And then we call the other one your back bar. So you can equip two weapons at once. So you could have a staff and then a sword or a staff and a staff. It's really up to you, but you can have two weapons. And each weapon is what we call a bar because you have a bar of skills and then you can switch bars and then you have another bar of skills. So you can have a total of 12 different abilities slotted, five abilities and an ultimate on each bar. By default, you'll be able to see five abilities and one ultimate and then you'll swap bars and you'll be able to see the other one. I have an add on that lets me see both bars at the same time. Next to that, you have your active consumable on display. You can change the consumable that is active by holding down Q and selecting it from your quick slot wheel. So right now I have a potion active. So every time I press that button, my potion would go off or I could change to my food and then eat my food. And that's going to give me a food buff. The way you change the buffs and the consumables that are on the bar is you open up your inventory and you click on the quick slot button. And now you can drag anything you want from your inventory over to here and replace the items or put them on there if you don't have anything there yet. You could also put things like tools. Once you've unlocked some tools, maybe from some of the expansion zones or mementos, if you just want to do something fun and cosmetic, you can use these, right? These can all be slotted onto your quick slot wheel and then you can choose them anytime. Then at the top of the screen, we have our menu bar and this is going to have your crown store first, which is going to have all of the crown store items. This is where you can buy cosmetics. You can buy some pay to advance faster kind of things. You can also buy those crown crates. And if you buy crown crates, they will show up right here and then you can open crown crates. The important thing to know about crown crates one is you can earn crown crates by watching my stream when I am playing ESO. So be sure to swing by twitch.tv slash lucky ghost and see if I have any crown crates dropping. That's going to be able to give you everything from potions and mimic stones all the way to a pet or a mount. And you will get one of these Ouroboros crates just like this. And then you'll open these crates right now. He gave me four cards. That means I did not get a mount. The mount would be in the fifth card in the middle. The good things always come in the fifth card that he throws last. If you get four cards, I'm sorry, that's not good news. So then we open these up and as usual, we got some potions and a crown item right here, right? These are all items that I do not want to keep. I want to go ahead and convert these to gems. One of the nice things about the crown sort is that when you open these crates and you don't get anything good, which is most of the time going to be the case, you can go back and then you can click this button here, gem extraction. Now I can turn these bad items from the crate into a currency called crown gems. And it's kind of like a mercy currency or a pity currency. So if you keep gambling on these crates and you don't get what you want, then you can go ahead and continue turning those into gems. And eventually you'll have enough gems to buy whatever it is that you wanted in the crates. Like I mentioned, that means you're likely going to be spending somewhere around $400 to get enough to say buy something like these Radiant Apex mounts. If we go down here, uh, we can see this Radiant Apex mount here is going to cost $2,000. 500 gems. That is an absolute ton of gems. And the gem price of these mounts has been going up from patch to patch. And just know that, you know, generally, if something has a higher gem price, it also has a lower drop rate. So the drop rate for all of these is incredibly low. And the drop rate for this horse is likely even lower. Still, it is going to be very, very difficult to get these guys. Be very careful if you start gambling for these crown crates. It's going to cost you hundreds of dollars. I almost guarantee it. So that's where you open the crates and then that's where you spend those gems or any other cash up currency you want to spend. Next, we have our inventory. That's what we were showing you earlier. And this is where you can browse your inventory. It's got these filters at the top that allow you to look at furniture, weapons. You know, you can sort it however you want to. And then there's sub filters also. That's great. So in the inventory, we also have our ESO plus craft bag. This is where you can see all of the crafting materials that you own. See how many I have here. I have hundreds of thousands of crafting materials spanned over hundreds of different slots here. There are hundreds and hundreds of these. These would take up, I don't know, thousands of space, thousands of inventory slots if they were all dumped into my inventory. But my inventory is only 200 slots big. So that's why it's imperative to have ESO plus if you do end up playing this game for a long time. And if 
if you don't have ESO Plus, then it's still doable, but you're probably going to have to forego interacting with a lot of the crafting sides of the game because this is just too many materials to hold on to. You're going to be better off just selling them to an NPC, vendoring them, giving them away to a friend or something like that. Next, we have the currency tab. This is going to tell you how much of each type of currency you have in the game. You've got alliance points, which are earned through PVP. You've got the crown gems, which are earned by opening crates or watching my stream. You've got crowns, which you get from purchasing these. These are the cash shop currency that you turn into crown gems when you gamble for something and you don't get it. Uh, you've got event tickets, which or every month there's an event in ESO and usually that event will give between two and three tickets a day that you can use to buy some kind of cosmetic that is unique to that event. Then you've got your gold. Gold in ESO is going to be used for a lot of things. It's going to be used to buy upgrade materials. It's going to be used to buy items off of guild traders. It's going to be used for upgrading your bag space, right? Gold uses is used for a lot of things. As a new player, I would recommend spending your gold. The first thing you're going to spend your gold on is upgrading your bags and upgrading your bank space. You will never regret maxing out your inventory space and your bank space. So I say dump all your gold there first, as well as upgrading your mount at the mount trainer. I would start with speed if I was you, because you're never going to feel like you're moving too fast in ESO. It's a massive game with lots of land to cover and getting that mount speed early really helps. Next, we've got your outfit change tokens. This is just going to let you change your outfit. Next, we've got without paying the gold fee that's associated with that. Not a big deal, honestly. Uh, and then we've got sales of endeavor. This is the free currency that was added to the game that you can use in lieu of crown gems. So if you want one of those really spicy mounts I was showing you earlier, there is a way to get those now without spending real money. But to get that mount that I was showing you, it's likely going to take you about 10 to 12 months of doing these daily quests. There's three dailies every day and you have to do them every day for about 10 to 12 months, as well as there's one weekly you can do every week and you've got to do that every week for about 10 to 12 months, and then you'll be able to get the mount. Unfortunately, the cash shop rotates mounts every three months. So if you see a mount that you like right now, uh, you probably won't be able to get it with these seals. It's best not to look at the cash shop until you have enough seals to get a mount and then start looking at it. Otherwise, the FOMO is going to get the best of you. Next, we have the Telvar stones. The Telvar stones are earned in PVP. These are specifically earned in Imperial City. That's a PVPVE zone where you can fight NPCs or you can fight players and much of the reason for being there is to earn this currency specifically. Then you've got transmute crystals. These are a very important currency in ESO. You get these from doing random daily dungeons or for participating in Cyrodiil. And these allow you to retrate your items. Every item drops with a trade on it like divines, which increases your Mundus effect or uh, some other trait. And those traits are very important in ESO. They make they give you a very important stat. You can use these transmutes to retrate the item or to recraft it from scratch once you've already found it. I'll go over the transmute system in much more detail later in the video, but just know it's an important currency. There's a lot of reasons for it. Then we've got undaunted keys. Undaunted keys are going to be earned from doing your pledges and then writ vouchers are going to be earned from doing master writs. We'll talk about all of these things in more detail as we go through this video and when I get to those sections. OK, the next screen is going to be the character screen. The character screen is going to tell you everything about like, well, it's going to just tell you some super superfluous, like super basic things about your character, what title you've chosen. These have no statistical impact on your character. It's purely cosmetic. You just pick one. Uh, and there are a lot of titles in the game. I have hundreds. I don't know, maybe even a th I don't know how many I have. I have a ton of these nearly every single title in the game. There's a lot of them, so they're purely cosmetic, though. They're not going to give you any stat bonuses or anything like that, so don't stress it too much. Just pick what sounds fun or looks cool, in your opinion. Then you've got your attributes here. Uh, more often than not, mag DPS are going to go 64 mag, stamp DPS are going to go 64 stamp, tanks are going to go 64 health, something like that. Usually what these people are doing right now, that's subject to change depending on the patch, so always be checking out my build guides. These, uh, I'll link those down in the description below. Those will tell you where to put your attribute points, which Mundus stone to pick up. You can also see that here in your character page, which Mundus we have. Right now we have the Lover, as this tune was doing a lot of solo content. You can change your Mundus Stone anytime for free. You just got to go up and interact with that Mundus Stone somewhere in the world. The important thing is that you have one on you. So grab one of these early, like the first Mundus Stone you see, grab it. Uh, unless you're following one of my guides, then, you know, find a way to get to the one that I recommend. But any Mundus Stone is better than no Mundus Stone at all. And like I said, they're free and you can change them anytime you want. Next, we have the skills that you can choose. It's actually skills and passives that you can choose. So at the top is always going to be your three class lines. It's got your skills here that you can invest in. So you can always unlock a skill and then you'll have the chance to morph it into one of two other abilities. Every skill has a base version and then two morphs that you can choose from. Every skill line also has passives that you can use to upgrade 
your class and your character. ESO is a game where it's a sum of a thousand parts, right? There's no one passive that's going to make you incredibly strong, but there are so many passives in all these different skill lines that when you eventually have all of them, they add up to making your character incredibly strong. Generally, you're going to want to grab all your class passives. You're going to want to grab all of your weapon passives for whichever weapon types you're using. You do not need to grab weapon passives for weapons that you're not using. Those won't help you grab the armor passives for the armors that you're using. So if you're using medium armor and light or medium mostly or entirely, just grab medium, right? But if you're wearing a little bit of light, definitely grab the medium, uh, definitely grab the light armor passives as well. ESO lets you build your character any way that you want. And what this means is you can create incredibly powerful characters and you can also create paperweights you can create absolute messes of characters it's very easy to make a character that is not very combat effective it might be fun but it might not be very strong you know that's one of the great things and the bad things about unlimited character customization that ESO offers you so if you feel like your character is a little weak or if you feel like you see other people that are a lot stronger than you definitely check out one of my written guides uh, but when you first start the game you know I highly encourage you to go around Splunk explore and you know unlock the skills that look cool to you you can always respec it later for a very cheap and you get one free respec at level 43. So, you know, don't stress when you're ready for a best in slot build for your character, then go ahead and check out my link down in the description below for build guides. I have build guides for solo content, for group content, you know, for raid content, whatever you're looking to do and more. OK, next, let's talk about race. Which race should you choose? First, let's start with the meta. Stamina DPS are either going to go Dark Elf and even Khajiit. These two are neck and neck right now as far as raw damage output goes, followed closely behind by or and then ironically high elf puts out a ton of damage and then red guard and wood elf are going to be your sustain races these are the ones that have passives that are going to improve your ability to cast lots of stamina abilities without running out of stamina these are especially useful when you're lower champion level where it's usually harder for you to sustain later on your sustain gets a lot better because of your champion passives and these become much less necessary for the mag dps we've got high elf as your best in slot race followed very closely by dark elf and Khajiit. Next, in an interesting change of pace, we've got Orc, which is typically a Stam tune, but since they have a spell damage line, they actually put out a decent amount of Magicka DPS. And then we've got Breton, which is your sustain race for Magicka DPS tune, which simply means they're able to cast more magic spells for longer without running out of resources. Same with the Red Guard and Wood Elf for stamina. This is more useful early on when you don't have the champion points that are going to allow you to have better sustain. This is also insanely useful for solo builds where you you don't have people in your party that are giving you buffs that improve your sustain. So Breton is actually a really solid choice for solo mag DPS and Wood Elf and Red Guard are fantastic choices for solo stam DPS. Next, we've got the healer and tank roles. The best in slot healer class right now is Breton for the sustain. Runner ups are going to go to Argonian, High Elf, Khajiit and Dark Elf. And then the best tank class is going to be Nord, followed closely by Imperial and Argonian. And even Red Guard is not a bad choice. Do you have to pick one of these? What if you don't like the meta option? Well, don't worry. These are just suggestions. These are just the ones that perform the best. But even the worst performers for a role are still going to be able to do all the content in the game, albeit it will be a little more difficult for them. The only place in which it really, really matters which race you pick is going to be in the very end game content where you want every advantage you can get just so that you have a chance at taking down the content that you need to take down within the time limits that are imposed upon you. OK, so now let's dive deep into each one of these races, passives and talk about which of their passives are actually useful, which ones you should pay attention to, which ones you should ignore, and what makes them tick. We're going to go through this list alphabetically, so let's start with Argonian. Argonian gets 1,000 of each resource, which makes them a really well-rounded race. They get 6% increased healing done, which is one of the reasons that they're fantastic healers. They also get a disease resistance line, which I'm going to be honest with you. These two right here, we don't think about much. They're there, but they're not making a huge impact on any content in this game. This here is massive. Massive though, they get 3,125 health, magicka, and stamina every time they drink a potion. Typically, when someone drinks a health potion, they get health and nothing else. If they drink a stamina potion, they get stamina and nothing else. And if they drink a magicka potion, they get magicka and nothing else, but not the Argonian. It's a tripod for them, which are actually very expensive potions most people have to buy. Argonians use any potions and they get a tripod for free, which means it's going to give them all three resources every time they drink a potion. This passive is especially useful for tanks who are constantly draining all three resource 
most pools. And then we have the last passive line, which I'm going to go over for every race. And I want you to ignore this one when you're choosing your race, because it doesn't matter. The reason this one doesn't matter is because it's always going to give you some kind of boosted XP, right? To a skill line, a weapon line, or an armor line. It's something that doesn't matter past the first 1% of the game. Your character is going to max out that skill line within the first week or two. And then you play this MMO for months or even years. And this line right here is doing absolutely nothing for you because it's so easy to get to max level on all of these skill lines. This passive on every race should be ignored when you're picking your character and think of it more like, oh, I picked Argonian bonus. I get resto staff skill line XP, but this should in no way dictate which race you play because after the first week of being on your character, it no longer matters because the skill line is going to be maxed out with or without this passive. Then it gets 50% swimming speed, the most RP passive in the game. There is no real water content in this game. So this passive is mostly a meme. Breton, 2000 max Magicka, minus 7% of Magicka abilities cost, 130 Magicka recovery. These three right here are the heart and soul of the Breton. This is why we pick them for mag tunes. This is why healers choose them. They have fantastic sustain, unmatched by any other Magicka race. This sustain is perfect for healers. It's perfect for Magicka damage dealers, and they get spell resistance, which is fantastic for solo builds. I really like running Breton on a character I know I'm going to be doing almost exclusively solo content on because when you're soloing, that's where you're most likely to run into resource management problems. You don't have a healer throwing you resources. You don't have a tank buffing you. It's you alone that's responsible for making sure you don't run out of resources. So all of these passives are really nice. You will very often be burning, chilled, or concussed, so you'll get an additional 2310 resistances. This right here is going to be why this is a fantastic solo class on top of the sustain, which is really difficult to manage when you're soloing. You get quite a bit of spell resistance, which is really nice as you will be taking all of the damage when you're soloing. You won't have a tank in front of you, so this is going to help to mitigate some of that damage for you, which makes Breton a really nice solo race. My favorite for Magic Attunes. And then we've got the last one, which I've asked you to ignore when considering a race, right? We get 15% light armor skill line XP. Great. You're going to level up your light armor a little bit faster. It doesn't matter because instead of being maxed out in a few days, it's going to be maxed out by the fourth day of the character, at which point this may as well have never existed. Also, you get 1% bonus alliance point gain, which isn't nothing, but it's really close to nothing. Next, we've got Dark Elf, which is going to be one of our jack of all trades races. They get max stamina and max magicka. They get weapon damage and spell damage, which makes them one of the best in slot races for both stamina damage dealers and magicka damage dealers. So if you don't know if you want to be a stam DPS or a mag DPS, you can pick Dark Elf and be ready for either one. Then they've got a massive 4,620 flame resistance, which is actually a pretty substantial amount of flame resistance. Recently, they doubled the amount of flame resistance they get to make this buff matter. And it worked. This can be pretty nice in certain content where you're taking a lot of fire damage. And then last and definitely least, we have the superfluous line, which is going to give us dual wield XP and minus 50% damage from lava. There is no content in which this is going to be relevant. Nobody should be standing in lava. And if you stand in lava for very long, you're going to be dead anyway. 50% less damage or no. Next up, let's go over High Elf. High Elf is the best in slot mag DPS race because they get 2000 max magicka and 258 spell damage. If you notice here, that is barely edging out the max mag for Dark Elf. So they are just a hair better. And I mean, just a hair. It's very, very close between the High Elf and the Dark Elf. But the Dark Elf has the ability to go mag or stam. So it's really not a bad choice to choose Dark Elf. However, High Elf does also get restore 625 of your lowest magicka or stamina after activating any ability. So they've got a nice little sustain passive built in here, which is actually pretty useful. They also get a 5% damage reduction while casting abilities. We don't cast a lot of channeled abilities. This might come in handy if you are using a channeled spammable like crystal shards on a sorcerer. For a lot of classes, this is not going to do anything for you. Then we have 15% destruction staff skill line and 1% generic XP gain. Again, it's not nothing, but it's very close. High Elf will be an excellent choice for anybody that wants to be a magic DBS tune. And in a recent patch, they were also given weapon damage, making this best in slot mag DPS not a bad choice for stamina DPS. Next, we have Imperial, who's great for tanking and for PvP. You get 2,000 additional health, you get 2,000 stamina, and most importantly, you get minus 6% costs of all your abilities. This is great for your sustain, and this applies to your ultimate as well. This means you can cast your ultimate 6% sooner because it costs 6% less to cast it. And then for our superfluous line, we've got the 15% one hand and shield skill line XP and 1% extra gold gained. 
Next, we have Khajiit, the other Jack of all trades race. Khajiit is going to give you max health, mag, and stamina. They're also going to have 100 health recovery. Then they're also going to have 85 mag and stam recovery. So you see they're getting mag health and stam. Then they're also getting mag and stam recovery. Then they're getting crit damage to both mag and stam damage. And they're getting crit healing in case you want to be a healer with this character. Khajiit is the most well-rounded race in the game, best suited for every role in the game. They've got mag recovery, stam recovery, health recovery. They've got crit damage and crit healing. Literally, they have every role in the game covered, whether it's a tank, a healer, or a DPS. And then they've got this RP passive down here, which is going to reduce the range in which they're detected by three meters. This is never going to come in handy in group content. It can be useful while you're soloing around or RPing or thieving or questing. But generally in group content, you're never going to be sneaking anywhere. It doesn't really work out that way. And then we've got our superfluous passive, 15% medium armor skill line and an actually useful passive here. 5% uh, chance to pickpocket. This one right here is not bad if you're going to go around pickpocketing or using that as a way to make money. You can do that. An additional 5% chance so that your chance to succeed on a pickpocket is 80 or 85% instead of 75 or 80% can be really nice. Next, we've got Nord, which is considered to be the best in slot race for tanks by most of the player base. Nords get 1500 max stamina and 1000 health. They also, most importantly, get 2000 1,600 physical resistance and spell resistance, and then an additional 4,620 old resistance. That is a ton of resistances to damage that they get for free. Other races, if they play tank, they've got to go and acquire these types of resistances by putting on gear. But not the Nord, they get it built in as a racial passive, which is a large part of why people choose them for tanks. And just like the other passive I talked about earlier, this one was recently doubled to make it a more meaningful passive. It used to be 2310, and now it's 4620, which means it's now something that's pretty exciting. They also get five ultimate generation whenever taking damage. Well, as a tank, they're always taking damage, which means every 10 seconds they get an additional five ult charge, which is great. One of the things tanks are doing the most in this game is casting their support ultimate to make their DPS do more damage or to help them survive. Either way, this is incredibly useful for a tank. And then finally, we've got the two handed skill line XP. Again, please ignore this one when you're choosing your race. It doesn't matter. And then finally, we've got 15 extra minutes on a drink buff. This is nice if you're using a drink buff. 15 minutes is a decent amount of time. These buffs typically last for one to two hours. So 15 minutes on top of that is not bad. Next, we have the Orc. Orc used to be the best in slot race for stamina DPS, but they got a little bit of a nerf and some other races got a buff, making them now maybe the third best in slot for stamina DPS. They get 1,000 max stamina. They get 1,000 of their max health, and then they get a 2,125 heal whenever they deal damage every four seconds. So this works out to be a little over 500 health per second that they end up having come in because of this passive, which is kind of nice for solo. It's not incredibly useful in group content. They also have 258 weapon damage and 258 spell damage. Because of this line right here, they're actually decent as a mag DPS choice, which is kind of weird, but this was added in the last patch. So there it is. They've also got a 10% sprint speed bonus and minus 12% sprint cost, which is incredibly useful for melee DPS as you're constantly trying to close ground on enemies, which means you're sprinting and it's costing you 12% less to do so than other races. And then last and definitely least, they get their heavy armor skill line XP, which you should ignore. And then they also get a 10% inspiration bonus, which means when you deconstruct gear, your crafting bench levels 10% faster. And just like your heavy armor skill line, your crafting benches will be leveled in a matter of days or a couple of weeks. They'll be max level. And then this passive line, again, it's going to be doing nothing for your characters. So do disregard it when choosing your race. Next, we have Redguard. Redguard gets 2000 max stamina, minus 8% weapon ability cost. For these reasons right here, it's an especially good stamina DPS class, particularly when it comes to sustain. Great for low CP characters or new players. Decent for tanking. But with sustain being what it is presently in the game, it's, it's fairly easy to sustain, especially in group content. And this passive is a bit overkill. I would much rather have the weapon damage from one of the races that gives weapon damage if I'm going to be a stamina DPS. They also get minus 15% snare slowing. This feels really good. They get 1,005 stamina restore when dealing damage, improving their sustain even further. And then again, 15% one-handed shield skill line XP and an extra 15 minutes on food buffs. Most of our buffs in this game are food buffs, so you get an extra 15 minutes on that one or two hour buff. It's nice. It's not nothing. This one's actually something, but it's nothing to write home to mom about. And last but not least, the Wooda. 
itself. The Wood Elves get 2,000 max stamina, 258 stamina recovery. For these reasons right here, they make decent stam DPS. They're more of a sustain pick than a damage pick. And as I kind of mentioned, sustain is already pretty easy in ESO right now. So it's a little bit overkill to pick a race just for the sustain. I would typically opt for the damage. However, there is a compelling argument to be made for Wood Elves, especially for solo play. And we'll get into why here. You've got the 2,000 uh, poison resistance and disease resistance, which is another thing where you don't really notice it or think about it while you're playing the game. You get three meter stealth detection. Again, you don't really notice this, especially in PVE content. This might come in useful in PVP. They get a constant 5% move speed bonus, which is nice. 5% is something. It's not a lot, but it's something. They get 950 physical and spell penetration. And this is probably the most interesting line that I see here. Stamina tunes right now are struggling to penetrate the enemy's resistances. And especially while soloing, it's pretty difficult to meet the pen caps. So for this reason, Wood Elf, you know, you can make a pretty good argument for Wood Elf, despite not getting that weapon damage line. They do get max stamina and they are getting some free penetration that other stamina races don't get, which can allow you to spec into more weapon damage to kind of help balance things out. They also get 10% fall damage protection, which means you're going to take 10% less damage when you fall from something. Fall damage in ESO is pretty significant. It's pretty punishing. There was a passive built into the game called Breakfall now. It's in the champion point tree where you get 35% fall damage reduction. So this 10%, it wasn't very much before, and it's even less significant now with that other CP passive being built into the game. It'd be cool to see them increase this and make it a little more interesting for what else. And then you get your 15% bow skill line XP. Again, ignore this. It doesn't matter. Do not feel like you have to go bow because what else have a bow passive. I can't express how important this is not, right? This doesn't matter. Ignore this line. And then, of course, you should very much be aware of the fact that what else are known to eat friends neighbors and family members be wary wood elves are cannibals due to the green pact a tree in the forest told them they are not allowed to eat green things they must preserve the forest and so it instead said you have to eat people and wood elves do this this is written into the lore of the game if you don't believe me go ahead and google green pact and see what that's all about think of them as like anti-vegans wood elf mains don't get mad i'm just the messenger all right now let's talk about attributes i touched on them a little bit before but now we're going to dive all the way in you're going to get a total of six 64 attribute points while playing Elder Scrolls Online. You get these every time you level. Sometimes you'll get one and sometimes you'll get more than one when you level, depending on the level that you are. Once you get to 50, you will no longer get any more attribute points. You'll be capped out at 64 total. If you're a Magicka DPS, you're likely going to go 64 Magicka. And if you're a healer, you're going to go 64 Magicka. If you're a stamina DPS, you're likely going to go 64 stamina. And if you're a tank, you're probably going to go almost entirely into health and maybe just a little bit into stamina or Magicka. Usually tanks are going to want to have a little more Stam than Magicka so that when they grab synergies, they get Stamina back and not Magicka. That's more of a finer detail that'll be explained in one of my build guides. The reason that we presently pump all of our points into either Magicka or Stamina is because it's going to make you have more of that resource. So if you put 64 into Magicka, then your Magicka pool will be bigger. If you put 64 points into Stamina, then your Stamina pool will be bigger. Instead of having 13,000 Stamina, you'll have 36,000 Stamina, that sort of thing. And and your damage that you do is in part based on the size of your resource pool. So what you want to do is make one resource pool as big as possible. And then when it's determining how much damage you're doing to the enemy, one of the things it asks is how big is their biggest resource pool? And that's factored into the formula. So if you're a Magicka tune, you're going to be wearing a lot of gear that happens to give some Magicka. So then you want to pump all your points into Magicka so that that Magicka stat is really big multiplier when it calculates your damage. Same thing for stamina. And when you're a tank, tanks in ESO just, they really don't do damage. So they could care less about those two stats. What they want to be doing is not dying. They want to be able to take a ton of damage. And so they're going to pump health. Once you get to 50, you're going to stop getting attribute points. And instead, you're going to get champion points. As I mentioned earlier, there's a total of 3,600 champion points, but you're only really going to be using 1,400 at a time. So when you hit around 1,400, you are as strong as you're going to be. At that point, it's just a matter of picking and choosing which stars you're invested in because you can only invest in so many at a time. So the way champion points work is you have these three constellations. Every time you level, you get a point into one and it rotates. So your first champion level will give you a point into the green tree. The second one will give you one point for the blue and the third one will give you a point for the red and it'll just continue to rotate like that a point into green blue red green 
blue, red every time you level, right? And when you go into these trees, you'll see that there's all these different stars. And if you hover over them, it tells you what that star does. So for example, Fighting Finesse says, increases your critical damage and critical healing done by 4% per stage. And if you look at this star, it has two stages. There's the one bar. And if I put points into it, it starts filling up, right? And then right there, now that bar is filled. So now we have 4% crit damage and critical healing. And then if we fill it all the way up, we have 8% from this node. Now there's three types of nodes in the constellations. There are your slottable nodes, which means they don't work unless you slot them. This is a slottable node. So I would have to drag it up here and replace one of these slottables, right? You can only have four slottables at a time. And this is to prevent too much power creep from happening from the system. So some of these stars you have to pick and choose between. So you've got your slottables, which are the big bright ones. You can see they're very big and very bright. Then you've got the always on stars, the yellow stars. These are passives that are always on all the time. So you can max these all out. So you're going to max all the yellow stars out. And then you've got the purple stars. These actually open sub constellations. So if you click on it, now you've got a sub constellation with more yellow stars and more slottables. And like I mentioned, you're going to max all of your yellow stars and then you're going to pick four slottables and you're going to slot those up here. And that's how you would handle this tree. This is probably the most confusing part of the game for new players because there are so many options. And at first, it's not very clear which stars are good and which stars are bad. And this is where I highly encourage you to use one of my written guides to, uh, if nothing else, come up with your own build and then go to my written guide and have it help you with your CP usage. And it'll tell you which stars to invest in. And most builds are going to use 90% the same stars. So if you just go grab my, my CP build, uh, it's going to be perfect for yours. It's going to be more than good enough. And you're going to have to repeat this process for each tree. So blue tree is going to be your offensive tree. This is where your damage is coming from primarily. The red tree is going to be damage mitigation and sustain. And then the green tree is going to be quality of life things. So like taking less fall damage, 50% reduced cost of your way shrines, right? There's no power in the green tree. The whole point of the green tree is it's supposed to be the fun tree. This is where you can kind of, you can spec into things based on what you're doing. Some of these make you better fisher. Some of them make you a better thief. Some of them make you move faster. Some of them make you use less potions when you're in combat. Some of them make you gather better, right? So it's mostly for all of the uh, RP side of the game, the collecting and the, the skilling and all that sort of stuff. So this is personal preference almost entirely, whereas the blue tree and the red tree are very much going to determine how strong your character is. Next up, I'm quickly going to touch on major and minor buffs. The way major and minor buffs work in ESO, these are very, very important. These are very powerful buffs. The named buffs are very powerful. And generally, when you're putting your build together, you're going to want to make sure that you have a few very critical ones. And right now, for instance, if we look at this skill, Barb Trap has minor force attached to it. You can see it there in the description of the ability. So minor force will stack with major force, but minor force will not stack with minor force. The purpose of giving these buffs names is so that you know that you cannot stack it with another buff of the same name. So you would not want to wear two skills that give you minor force, or you would not want to wear an ability that gives you minor force and then wear an armor that gives you minor force, right? Because minor force does not stack with minor force, but you could wear something that gives you minor force and wear something that gives you major force as long as it is not the same exact name. So a minor buff will stack with a major buff and a minor buff will also stack with a different minor buff. So you could have minor force and you could stack that with minor savagery as long as it's not the exact same name, you're good to go. That's just something that's worth mentioning that a lot of people don't know about when they first jump into ESO. Okay, next up, let's talk about roles. In Elder Scrolls Online, you have your three archetypical roles. You have your tank, your healer, and your DPS. Your tank is going to be responsible for taunting all of the mobs, getting them to face him and to attack him, especially the dangerous mobs and the bosses. The healer is going to be responsible for keeping everybody alive and dishing out buffs and synergies for the group. And the DPS are going to be responsible for doing damage and rezzing whoever Ever falls down. Since the tank is busy tanking and the healer's busy healing, it's going to be the DPS's job to res somebody if they go down. If you want the shortest queues and the most friends, go ahead and choose tank. There's not nearly enough tanks in Elder Scrolls Online. Healers are the next in line to be most sought after. And then DPS, well, there's just more than enough DPS. Just like every MMO, there's way too many DPS. That doesn't stop me from maining a DPS. I love to play the role. But just know that you're going to have the longest queues and the most competition for the role if you play a damage dealer. On the flip side, though, damage dealers have the most fun 
on questing, whereas tanks and healers can, it can be a little bit of a slow slog through the questing experience because they don't deal hardly any damage. All right, are you still with me? Next, let's go ahead and talk about Mundestones. We touched on them just briefly earlier, but let's go in a little bit deeper this time. So Mundestones are gonna be located all throughout the world. You've got Mundestones like the Warrior, the Tower, the Thief, and these are buffs. This is how many there are in the game. Look at them all. You can see them around this perimeter here. There are a ton of different Mundestones, each with its varying amounts of usefulness, and uh, it changes from patch to patch which one is the most effective Mundus for your role. So it'll usually be tanks are wearing one, DPS are wearing another, and healers another still. If you want to know which Mundus you should use, as always, go ahead and check out my guides linked in the description down below. But here's how Mundus work. You just walk up to it and then you interact with it. So this is the warrior. Right now I have the lover, right? I just interact with it, accept the sign. My character's going to go ahead and suck that on in. And then if we look at my character now, I have the warrior boon instead of uh, the one that I had before, which was lover. And it says increases your weapon damage by 238. And if we were to go ahead and take tower, same thing. It's free. So you can pick up a Mundus and I highly encourage you to pick one up right away, even if it's the wrong one. Just grab the first one that you see when you're a new player, because it's more important that you have something instead of nothing. Anything's going to be better than nothing. And then, you know, refer to my guide when you're ready to grab the best one for your character. There's two different places that you can find these Mundus stones. One is in somebody's house. Somebody could have bought them all and put them in their house, like in the house I'm in right now. However, these are very expensive. I don't even want to know how many dollars it took to put all of these in this house. Probably hundreds, I'm guessing. So um, if we open up the map, there's a free way to get these. If you don't have a friend, for instance, that spent hundreds of dollars putting them all in their house, you open up your map and then you look for these symbols like this one right here. It's the steed, right? And if you go over to that and you grab it, it says the steed's going to increase your run speed by 5% and your health care free as well. So these are located all over the world. So maybe refer to one of my builds, see which one you need, and then Google where you could find that stone out in the wilderness. And then you just teleport to that zone and you run to that spot in the map and you grab the Munda stone that is recommended for your build. This is one of those things that new players often miss and they'll get to like level 50 and realize that they never grabbed this massive free passive that they could have been running around with since level one. So make sure to grab it early. Now, speaking of the open world, like I mentioned earlier, you can go to any zone in any order because there's world scaling. So the entire world, let's say the entire world is CP 160. The entire world is built like all your enemies are CP 160. And when you're level one, you're being given a hidden buff that makes your character perform as though he is CP 160, right? You're getting this buff, this general buff that makes your character a lot stronger than it is. So that allows your level one character to fight these 160 mobs. And when you level, that buff is slowly stripped away from your character so that when you so you'll see as you level your stats are actually going to go down unless you put on higher level armor to replace those lost stats right so if you keep leveling up but if you don't put any gear on your stats your character is actually getting weaker if you're not replacing your gear as you level up so if you're wearing level 20 gear at level 20 you'll be at 100 effectiveness but if you're wearing level 20 gear at level 40 now your character is only like 50 percent effective right you're actually even though you're higher level your character actually got weaker because you didn't replace that buff that's being stripped from your character. And then from 160 and beyond, you're just pure growth. You're just getting stronger every time you level. That power creep is really starting to kick in and you're going to notice that your character starts to kind of trivialize a lot of the questing content. It's not going to be, uh, let's say, very challenging for you out in the open world. You're going to have no problem knocking down those world bosses, the delve bosses and the public dungeon bosses. Anything that is single player, you will absolutely crush so once you hit 160 and beyond. When it comes to replacing the gear and the power that you're losing as you level up, your weapon is going to be the most important one. And we'll probably talk about that a little bit more in the gearing section, but your weapon is the thing that you want to be the highest level. Your weapon is the thing that you want to be the highest quality. Weapons have the single most damage gains attached to them. All right, next up, we're going to talk about respecing your character. So let's say that you're in here and you're choosing your skills and then eventually you decide, eh, I don't like this build. It's not feeling great. I want to change my skills. I want to change my passives. Your character is very fluid in ESO. They make it very easy to respec anytime you want. So don't stress about which skills you pick. You can come here and respec for next to nothing. It's a negligible fee. There's two things that you can respec here. One is your attributes and you just come up to the shrine of Oriel. These shrines are located in all of the faction cities in the game. So here's the one in Elden Root. You just come here and then there's the shrine right there, for example, uh, the TP shrine. So you teleport there and then you just run right over here and you've got the shrine to Oriel. 
interact with one of these in any zone that they are in as well. They'll be in all of the chapter zones as well as the faction zones. And then you make a donation of 3,200 gold, which is next to nothing once you get going in this game. And that's going to reset your attributes and allow you to spec them however you want. I'm going to put them all into stamina because this is a stamina DPS. And then you can also come to this shrine, the shrine to Stendar. It's this little thing here. You can kind of see it right there. And we have two options at this one. My character has every single sky shard in the game. And this is based on the cost of this is based on how many skill points you have. So the more skill points you have unlocked, the more it costs to do a full respec which is why mine is going to cost 22,000 if I need to do a full respec. Now, I have way more skill points than I need, so I almost never need to do a full respec. I'm just going to respec my morphs, my skill morphs, which is only going to cost 2,450. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, I'll quickly review what that means. So every skill, right, when you pick a skill like this one here, we have bone totem, right? So I put one point into that. And then at that point, it allows you to upgrade it one more time and you've got morphs, right? So I could either go remote totem or agony totem. And remote totem is going to basically be a similar skill, but it's going to allow me to cast it wherever I aim it, as opposed to right on top of me. It turns it into kind of a ranged ability, right? So if I do a full respec, I'll be able to get all of my skill points back, even the base one. If I do a morph respec, the, I would only be able to change the morph. I wouldn't be able to take the point out of the base skill. So I would be able to come here, uh, and then go to morphs. And if I go to that skill, I can take one point out, but I can't take both, right? Because I only paid the 2000 gold rather than the 22,000 gold. So I can't unspec from the base skill but I can change the morph, which is almost always going to be enough. So if possible, make sure that you choose the cheaper of the two options. Just re-choose your morphs as opposed to uh, the full price option, which for you is going to be much, much cheaper as a new player. It's going to be negligible. So if you need to do a full respec, go ahead and do a full respec. It's not going to cost as much until you're way, way deeper into the game. And you have so many skill points that this amount of gold doesn't matter. I right now have, uh, what do I have? 65 million gold on this character. So 20K, whatever, it doesn't matter to me. If you do decide to do a full respec, then and what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to take all the points out of a skill. See, it turned gray. I got all my skill points back. You're also going to be able to take points out of passives as well. If you're doing a partial respec, you won't be able to take these passive points out. Those are going to have to stay and you're only going to be able to take the morphs out. All right, next, we're going to talk about one more cool thing you can do in this area right here, which is you can talk to this priest. Now, the reason you would talk to this priest is if you have been cursed by the werewolf curse or the vampire curse, right? So if you're a vampire or a werewolf, he will give you the option to cleanse yourself for a negligible fee, something like 69 gold. No joke, right? So you come here and you then remove that curse. If you turn into a vampire or a werewolf, there's some good things that happen and there's some bad things that happen to you, right? It's a bit of a kiss curse kind of situation. So vampires, for instance, they get some cool vampire passives that reduce the damage they take when they're low, but they also have some downsides, like they take more damage from fire and non-vampire abilities cost more. Similarly with werewolves, you get extra stamina regen gen and some other cool passives, but you also take more damage from poison. So it's a little bit of a give and a little bit of take when you take on one of those curses. So sometimes you might decide, oh, you know what? I don't like being a vampire anymore. I don't like dealing with the downsides of it. I don't want to manage that. So you come to this guy and you can remove it. He is standing next to the shrines. So every time there is a shrine to Stendor and a shrine to Ariel, there's also the priest standing next to it where you can remove the curse of the werewolf or the vampire. All right, next up, let's go ahead and talk about sky shards. This is a sky shard right here. When you see one of these out in the world, you should grab it. Every three sky shards that you pick up, you get one skill point. When you grab it, this will happen. It'll play this nice little animation here and then when you get a third one you'll see it just went from five skill points to six now I have zero out of three so that'll fill up every time I grab one it'll go one out of three then two then three out of three uh, and it'll go back to zero and I'll get a skill point instead so every three that you get you get one skill point to spend in here you can unlock skills and passives with it grab them whenever you see them you can see them on the map they have this symbol right here if you go near one it'll automatically pop up on your map that's the game's way of helping you find it if you get close uh, so so because they can be kind of tucked into weird little places, kind of hidden out of sight. Uh, and that's just them being nice. They added that feature kind of recently, actually. And but but that only activates once you get fairly close to it. There's a nice add on called map pins. By the way, I will link my add ons guide in the description below so that you can have all of my favorite add ons. There are some really essential ones there, uh, but map pins will make it so that you can see them all over the map, regardless of whether you've been close to it. So like this one over here, I've never been anywhere near it, but I know I need to swing by that area and grab that sky shard on this character because I have not done that yet. 
All right, next up, let's talk about guilds. In ESO, you can be in five guilds at any one time, and that's because guilds have very specific purposes in ESO. In ESO, you can be in a trading guild, you can be in a uh, PVE guild, a role-playing guild, a social guild, a PVP guild, a questing guild, or a crafting guild, right? So because the only way to use a guild trader is to be in a trading guild, ESO lets you be in up to five guilds, basically. This is the reason. Otherwise, you can't really interact with the economy in a meaningful way. You've got to be in a trading guild and that trading guild must have a trader. So one of the things you're going to want to do once you have a ton of stuff that's worth selling is come in here, click on trading and then click on has trader. And then you're going to want to join one of these trading guilds. And you'll notice looking for serious trader. Join us. We have a consistent high selling kiosk, 200 K in sales or 30 K raffles weekly, right? So they want you to sell 200,000 gold worth of items every week. A new player should not join this guild because you're going to fail or you're going to stress trying to meet the sales quota. And it's just going to be, it's going to turn the game into a job for you. So don't join something like that. You want to join a, uh, a casual guild. So you'd be going in here and looking for one that says, hey, we welcome new players or there's no fees or super low fees. Something real easy for a new player to basically join. Right. So this one right here, no fees or mins. Let's make gold together. This would be a great one uh, for a brand new player. Likewise, you can use this to search for a group PVE guilds. These are what you would use to maybe find a guild to actively do trials and dungeons with. Uh, it's going to be a lot easier to join trial groups if you're in a guild that's running trials actively, as opposed to going to the zone of Craglorn right here. And you would stand in Belkarth, this town right here, and you just shout for a group for a trial and just like until someone hopefully picked you up or until you formed one yourself, right? It's not the best way to get into a trial, much better to join a guild that does that stuff regularly. Um, so definitely take advantage of the guild finder. In order to get to that, you just press G on your keyboard or open up the menu right here, guilds, and then you can click through and search for guilds that you want to join. That is the real player type of guilds. OK, now let's go over the PVE guilds. These are the guilds that you could pick up and they'll give you extra skills and extra passives to use. And some of these are going to be good for solely that activity. Like Thieves Guild is not going to make you stronger in combat, but it will make you better at thieving. So you'll like haggling. You can sell your fence items for 10 percent more. That's nice, right? A little extra income, but it's not going to make you stronger in trials and in dungeons. Same thing with Dark Brotherhood. No power in here, but there is some quality of life and some nice Dark Brotherhood related like passives like uh, bounty heat resulting from a witness murder or assault is reduced by 50%. So you have to pay less bounty if you get caught. Nice little passives in here. If you're doing that kind of like RP activity, uh, the other guilds, fighters, mages, sigic, and undaunted, these are all going to have skills and passives that help you do more damage in combat. One thing to know about these guilds is if you hover over the bar at the top, it tells you how to level that guild. So if we hover over the bar here, it says improve the skill line by increasing your rank in the Dark Brotherhood, complete Gold Coast story quests, perform contracts, fulfill sacraments, right? So if you're ever not sure how to level a guild that you've unlocked, just hover over that bar and it will tell you. Fighters Guild, destroy dark anchors or kill Daedra. Boom. Easy. Nice, man. So Dark Brotherhood, like I mentioned, this is going to be passives uh, that are mostly just like RP related fighters guild. You've got some really powerful passives in here. These first four passives are so good right now. And uh, the skills are being used a lot right now. That's always subject to change. That's just the meta that exists today. So always check my written guides to find the most up to date builds and which guilds are in, which guilds are out. This first passive is always going to be useful, though. No matter the meta, it allows you to intimidate NPCs. This opens up dialogue options that allows you to skip, let's say, trivial parts of quests. So if you don't have this option, the NPC might say, now go pick up 10 rocks and you have intimidate. So you could be like, nah, man, I'll bash your skull. And if you do make me go do that and he'll be like, OK, you know, never mind. You don't have to go pick up the 10 rocks. And you're like, that's right. Thank you. Right. So this opens up extra dialogue options. It lets you skip some trivial parts of some quests that you would otherwise have to go to. Same with the Mage's Guild. Um, it's got some really powerful abilities and ultimates and some great passives. But this first one here is great for every build. It allows you to persuade NPCs, which instead of threatening to bash their head in so you can skip that part of the quest, you can say, hey, man, like we're after the same thing here. You know, let me skip the quest, right? Like you can you can appeal to their sensibilities, right? Sigic, this is a guild from Somerset, and it's got some really cool abilities that come and go from the meta, depending on the patch and uh, some passives that are pretty neat as well. Thieves Guild, this is a great one if you want to do thieving, if you want to go pickpocket enemies, steal things and make a bit of coin, uh, maybe steal some cosmetics or furnish 
furnishings, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff you can get from thieving and you here it tells you how to level it. You go to that zone and you do the zone story and some of the dailies, right? And you will help level your thieves guild and unlock all your passives that basically make thieving uh, more effective and easier to do. Undaunted, this is a skill line that every build in the game is going to take advantage of. It's going to basically have some cool skills, but very powerful passives, which increase your max resource values. So more stamina, more magicka, more health, and you get more of those things back when you grab synergies. So everybody grabs Undaunted. And if you're looking for a really friendly player guild to join, uh, just join the Discord and request an invite in the request an invite section of the Discord for ESO, and we'll get you right in so that you have new players and veterans alike to play with. Uh, you can ask them questions or you can join them in activities, right? No reason to play this game alone, uh, especially when you could be in my guild. The next skill lines we're going to talk about are scrying and excavation. You get both of these at the same time from the Graymore chapter, and these are a three step system that allows you to dig up really cool items in ESO. It allows you to dig up furnishings. It allows you to dig up a mount. It allows you to dig up mythic items. These are really, really powerful one piece items like Ring of the Pell Order, my favorite one that gives you life leech really effective while soloing, right? The scrying and excavation is really cool. So I'll really quickly go over how it works and what it is, but I have an entire video guide devoted to scrying and excavation. Make sure you check that out. Uh, if you feel a little bit confused and overwhelmed when I go over it right now, you probably will because that video is like 12 minutes long and I'm going to go over it in like one minute right now, but you're going to get the gist of it from here. So scrying and excavating, how do you get to it? What is it? So you unlock the skill lines and you're going to get all of these passives. They are all very, very good. The best passive is the fat, the last one right here. It says keen eye treasure chest. This is going to make treasure chests glow so that you never miss a treasure chest out in the wild ever again. What is scrying and excavating? So it's going to give you this menu right here. It's the antiquities menu in your journal. So if you're on PC, you press J or you click this icon right here if you're on console, right? And you could open up one of these scries that you have available to you. And then you're going to use your skills that you have up here at the top. At first, you don't have very many, right? You start with one skill, but eventually you unlock all these cool skills that help make scrying easier. And the first goal is to connect all the dots by using your skill. So I lit up the tiles and connected all these glowing dots that were in here, right? And now it's like, oh, good, you successfully scried. So it's going to fill that up. One check mark for each dot I connected. And if you run out of like scrying power while you're doing that, and you only connect five of the dots, then you'll have two things. If you only connect four, you'll have three places you have to go search for the item, right? So it says, uh, go down here and scry the item. So we would come over here. Now we're down here in the middle of that blue circle, and we're going to use our antiquarian eye. This thing right here on my Hot Wheel. Now you can see it's selected here. You can get that on the Hot Wheel by pressing, uh, well, opening your inventory, going to quick slots, going to tools, dragging the antiquarian eye onto the wheel, right? Then you use it from here. And if you use it, there's going to be this thing that spawns and it's pointing towards, right? The light is going towards your destination. So if you're not sure which way you go, which way is the light traveling from this thing? It's traveling this way and it points right here. Boom. A lot of people, they do this and they don't know you can put the eye on your wheel and have it tell you where in this big giant circle, because this is kind of a small one. Sometimes it's really big and there's a lot of stuff around and it's really hard to see this dig site. So using your eye to point to it is great. Then you're going to get this screen right here. This is where your excavation skill line. That was the scrying skill line. So when you get all the scrying passives, it makes scrying easier. And then as you level up excavation, it makes excavating easier. So at first you'll start with only this little brush, but then you unlock your trowel and your shovel, making it a lot easier to dig up your treasure. You're going to start off by using this as a hot and cold indicator, your auger here. So I always do the four corners, right? And I got lucky. I didn't even have to do those. It was right here. So now I'm going to try to pinpoint where, right? Green means it's under this spot. Yellow means you're close. Orange means it's, well, it's in the white area. You see that white outline? So that means this is telling us some part of the treasure is under this area here. If we follow that white box that it makes, right? And that's why it's hitting this node right here. We know that it is here and it is here. So I'm going to dig it up. I'm going to dig that area right there. So I'm going to flatten this whole area so I can use the shovel. Again, I'm going a little bit faster. I'm not really explaining how to use all the tools for that. You should watch my complete guide on how to do that. I dug up the treasure. I even got one of the little bonus treasures and we can further connect these fissures. OK, by having a equal depth connecting all of them and then using a double charge of the trowel. I know this is oh, I Trust me, I know this is a bit confusing because I'm going kind of fast, but boom. And that exposes the other secret treasures. Okay, The thing about the secret treasures is they are exposed not 
in a specific place, but by the number of tiles that you dig up. So this one was under the sixth tile, let's say, that you exposed. If the sixth tile you exposed was here, the treasure would be here. If the sixth tile you exposed was here, then it would show up over here, right? They are not in a set location. It's more of a mini game to unlock, like uncover uh, a number of tiles. So if I would have dug all of my tiles in the top left corner after, you know, digging up this, all of the bonus treasures would have been up here in the top left corner. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. It's just that their location is not bound to any one spot in here. It's bound to a number of tiles that you had uncovered. So really the name of the game after you dig up your treasure, you must do that first is to dig up as many tiles as possible. Um, and fissure connecting is the best way to do that. If you ever have any questions on fissures or scrying and excavating, check out my scrying and excavating guide link down in the description below. I have a whole video guide on that. It's kind of like it's a big topic to put into this really long guide. So, yeah, that's scrying and excavating. And as you can see, it gave me a new lead that I could go and I could go dig that one up next if I wanted to. Um, it could also give you a lead for the mythic item or a piece of furniture, right? You never know what you're going to get from those things. If you want to dig up certain leads or certain mythic items be sure to check out my website it has locations of the leads for mythic items especially the best mythic items so check that out link down in the description all right next let's dive in a little bit more on the front bar and back bar how they work why they work the way that they work how you should expect to be utilizing them in the future as kind of mentioned earlier, you have the front bar, which is the first two weapons here, and then the back bar, which is your back bar weapons. The back bar is going to be unlocked at level 15, so you won't have access to the back bar and the second weapon slot until you get to 15. And then once you get 15, you can put another weapon back there. So right now I'm running dual wield on the front bar. I'm wearing a two handed weapon on the back bar, and this is allowing me to put dual wield abilities on the front bar and two handed abilities on the back bar, as well as taking advantage of the passives that are associated with those weapons. The passives that are associated with those weapons are only active while you're on that bar. So I only get the uh, mall passives while I'm on the back bar. When I switch to the front bar, then I only get the like the dual wield passives. Same with any skills. So some skills buff certain bars. So for instance, like this skill right here, that last line in the description says, while slotted, your damage done is increased by 3%. That is only active while I'm on this bar. When I switch to the back bar, that skill's gone. And so is that 3% buff. Just something to know. The skills that come with buffs while slotted, if it says buff is active while slotted, that means only the bar that it's on gets that buff. When you switch to the other bar, you lose that buff. So you tend to want to put your bar buffers on the front bar and load up that front bar with bar buffers and like a spammable so that that front bar can do the most damage possible. And you want to spend as much of your time there as possible. You dip back into the back bar only when you need to to reapply like dots or buffs and things like that. At first, having two bars and managing two bars is going to feel like you are all thumbs. It's going to feel very funky and very awkward switching from one bar to the next, looking for the ability that you know is there somewhere when you have played the game for a while you'll be switching through you know, one to the next, you'll do a, you'll use your ability on the front bar and then you go to the back bar and use one ability You go to the front bar and use another and then to the back bar to use another. And you'll be switching and using abilities and firing them off in rapid succession before you know it. Trust me on that. I know at first it's going to feel awkward. At first it's going to feel like it's hard. Everybody starts there, but you know what? Far worse players than you have got good at bar swapping and using abilities. I, tr I just promise you that. Okay. All right. The next thing that we should go over is gear and sets. So Elder Scrolls Online has a uh, a couple different types of sets in this game, actually quite a few different types of sets. Elder Scrolls Online has, I think, over eh, around or over 500 sets in the game right now. Sets are, well, you get five pieces of a set and you get buffs for each different combination, right? So at two pieces of the set, you get in this set critical chance and on three sets, you get minor slayer. So if we take Reli, for example, Relican's Perfected Jack, when I have two pieces of this set, I get 657 crit chance. When I have three pieces, I get minor slayer. When I get that fourth piece, I get another line of crit chance. And when I have all five pieces, I get another two bonuses, right? So sets in Elder Scrolls Online work in that way. If you have two pieces, you get a bonus. If you have three, you get another one and four and so on all the way up to five pieces for most sets. There are some sets that are less and there are some sets that are more, but most of them are five pieces. So generally most builds, and I do say most because there are exceptions, most builds are going to be running two different five piece sets. So you'll run five pieces like on the body, right? One, two, three, four, five. And then you'll run five pieces on the jewelry and the weapons, right? One, two, three, four, five. Or one, two, three, four, five, right? A two-handed weapon counts as two pieces of a set. That's very important to know. A lot of players start the game and have no idea that that one item is counting for two pieces of a set. So they count and they're like, hey, wait, I only see one, two, three, four. I only have four pieces of the set. How is that gonna work? Well, no, that mall counts for two pieces 
right? So you are still getting that five pieces of pillar by putting that mall back there. And then we have another type of set. It's a two piece set called a monster set. And uh, depending on the meta that we're in, uh, sometimes every build will be running a monster set and sometimes almost none of them will be. So if you're running a monster set, it's going to be a two piece set that covers your head and your shoulder pieces. And monster sets are earned by doing dungeons. So the way you get a monster set is the head drops from a specific dungeon boss. So every dungeon's final boss drops a specific monster helmet if you do that dungeon on veteran. So on veteran, it's a guaranteed chance at that monster helmet. It might drop in light. It might drop in medium. It might drop in heavy. So you might have to run it a few times to get the weight that you want, right? whether it's light, medium or heavy. But you're guaranteed to get a monster helmet from that boss. It's, and every boss always drops the same monster helmet. So slime craw always drops in where sewers. So if you wanted slime craw, you go where sewers on veteran and you get your slime craw helmet. All of my written guides tell you where every piece of gear you need is dropped. It always tells you below the gear. It says your monster set drops here, your five piece set drops here and your other five piece set drops here. It always tells you exactly where to find each one. So you know which dungeon to go run to get each piece of gear. So you have your five piece sets, your two piece sets, and then you have your one piece mythic items. Mythic items are unique in that item. It's a one piece like of jewelry or a one piece of body armor that has a very powerful bonus bonus attached to it. So which mythic is in meta changes from patch to patch. And it's usually the meta one is like the newest one added to the game, right? Because it's an MMO and that's how it generally works. And then the best mythic item for soloing right now is generally the Ring of the Bell Order, for example, which is subject to change. If Zoss adds a newer, better mythic item for soloing, then, you know, we might equip that instead while we're soloing. Here is what a so here is an example of a mythic item. It's the Ring of the Wild Hunt. It's got this kind of orange text to it. And it says that while you're wearing this, this, you your move speed is increased by 15% while in combat and 45% while out of combat. So this is a fantastic mythic item for questing or exploring or uh, thieving, right? Because you are just zipping around. You move so fast. That 45% move speed is very, very fast. It's worth noting your move speed caps out at a 100% bonus. So whatever you do, don't try to get a, like a ton of move speed items and put them all on one character because you will be wasting a lot of that. You can only get plus 100% over the normal move speed. So this item alone is giving you 45%. You get a passive from the CP that gives you some more move speed. You get another item and boom, you're capped out on your move speed. So uh, just be aware of that. If you do start sacking move speed, it only lets you get 100% move speed. Same for your mount. Your mount can only have up to 100% bonus move speed. All right, next, let's talk about mounts. Mounts in Elder Scrolls Online are a mobility tool, but a little bit more than that also, because you can upgrade your mount to upgrade your character. Uh, mount upgrades are character specific. So if you fully upgrade your mount on one character, then all of the mounts on that character get those upgrades. But if you change to a different character, he will have zero upgrades. So let me show you what I mean by that. So what you're going to do is come to a stable master. It might look like this on the map if he's standing by himself from here. See the little horse. You go to that horse. In some zones, there won't be a horse on the map because it'll be standing some next to something else. Yeah, so you'll go to this horse on the map or look for the stable master. If you don't see a horse, it might be next to something, you know, like um, if we hover over this, there's a bunch of things on that tooltip. So uh, sometimes the stable master doesn't get the little horsey icon. He's mixed in with something else, but go to the stable master, generally a horse icon on the map, and you talk to him and he's going to show you the three things that you can upgrade. You can do one upgrade per day for 250 gold. It's a very trivial amount of gold. Do it every day. You're going to want to start with speed. At least most people will. Unless you don't have ESO plus, then there's a case to be made for carry capacity because your inventory is going to be a nightmare. So start with speed if you have ESO plus or start with speed if you're tired of moving slow and you're going to increase your move speed by 1% per day up to 60 times. So two months later, boom, you're maxed out on your move speed on your mount. The next thing I would do is carry capacity. This will uh, be another 60 days, right? So that's 60, that's 60, and then another 60, so 180 days or about half a year, and you fully upgraded your mount on one character. This is one of the reasons why sometimes people start their alts earlier than later. So like if you know you're going to make uh, maybe a necromancer next, you could start him today and then get these upgrades going because it is, you know, six months of upgrades that you have to get through before it's maxed out. At least the first 60 days, 
focus. Those are the big ones. Those are the ones you feel because when you go from a mount that has 60% increased move speed and then you get onto an alt that has 0% increased move speed, it's almost unbearable. You definitely feel it and you, you're like, oh man, I wish this was upgraded. Why do they make us do this one day at a time? This is awful, right? So that's something you'll hear people complain about. Why are mount upgrades not account wide? And maybe, maybe some days also we'll hear that call and maybe they will make them account wide one day, but today is not that day. So make sure you start these right away. And again, I recommend speed, then carry capacity, and then stamina, unless you're going to be going to Cyrodiil and being a PvP main, then maybe stamina after speed, because it's going to make it take longer for you to get knocked off your mount in PvP which is nice. You might be wondering how you get them out. Well, at level 10, it's a level up reward. So boom, you'll hit level 10. And then all you have to do is hit H on PC or whatever the mount button is on console and your mount will summon underneath you. You may have to slot the mount once you get it. It might not automatically be there. It'll most likely be there uh, on PC. It's going to be H. Um, but if for some reason you hit 10 and the mount doesn't spawn when you press the mount button, just open your collections menu, go to your mounts and then choose. You'll only have one. It'll be the sorrel horse and you just double click that and it'll equip it as your default mount. If you have other mounts, you can choose other mounts in here as well. This is all in your collections menu, which is right here, this little collections icon and then collectibles. And then you've got all the things you have collected, including mounts in here and just choose the one you want to use. Like I said, you'll start with the sorrel horse, this bad boy right here, right? He looks like this. Not quite as snazzy as the other horse I was riding, but hey, you know, he gets the job done. There's no difference in performance from one mount to the other. Mount skins are purely cosmetic. So whether your horse looks like, a, you know, some super epic superhero, whether he looks like this not so fancy sorrel horse right here, they move at the same speed. They perform the exact same. It's just a skin. It doesn't change the way they act at all. So don't feel like you have to seek out a better mount. It's purely cosmetic. Okay, next up, let's talk about the banker. You're going to see this symbol. It's a little chest on the map. This is the bank. The bank is great for a couple of reasons. One is it's got a ton of extra storage for you. 240 slots of extra storage if you don't have ESO plus or 480 extra slots if you do have ESO plus, right? It doubles it if you have ESO plus. This is where you can store all of the things that you want to hold on to to get them out of your character's inventory. Your bank is account wide, so you can put an item in here on one character and then pull it out on another character. A lot of items in ESO will be account bound. Almost no items will be character bound. So usually if you get an item, you can pass it between all of your characters once you've equipped it and once you've been using it, but you can't sell it to anybody else, right? So you can put it in your bank. Any of your characters can use it. Um, almost nothing in ESO is character bound. So there's almost nothing. I think the only things in ESO that are character bound are level up rewards so that you can't level up lots of tunes and abuse that by passing the level up rewards all to one character. So level up rewards are the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head that are character bound. Everything else is account bound when it's bound to you, which means you can use your bank to pass it between them freely. The other important thing that the bank gets used for and when we talk to him is you'll see here you've got bank, you've got guild bank and you've got guild store, right? So your guild bank, if you're in a guild, you might have a guild bank and then there might be items in here that you're allowed to take or you're not. That's it varies depending on the guild and how they set up their guild bank and the permissions in that guild bank. Generally, if you're in a guild, make sure you check with the guild leader before you start pulling stuff out of here. Just see what the rules are they might say hey it's one item a week one item a day or no items at all you know just check with them make sure you're not ruffling any feathers so that's your bank and then your guild bank and that leads us to the next topic i'll cover the guild trader and the guild store so eso does not have an auction house eso has a uh, 200 to 300 mini auction houses that players have to bid on so there's guild traders located all around the world here i'll run out to a group of them really quick for you right here on the map you can see this symbol it's a balance, right? It's like a balance. You've got the scales there, um, like the scales of justice, right? And then you've got a banner behind that, right? That banner indicates that it is guild traders. If you see the balance, you see that scale uh, without the ba the tabard or without that banner behind it, like this one right here. These are just NPC traders, like general merchant. It's, you know, he's selling you uh, really super basic items. It is not stuff that is being sold to you by other players or by trading guilds. The tabard means that is the stuff being sold by trading guilds. All right. So when you come up to the guild trader, you're going to see that nothing is there, right? And uh, that's not because they're not selling anything. It's because you haven't searched for something yet. They're actually selling hundreds or even thousands of different items on this one trader. So if you hit start search, it's just going to show you literally everything that's for sale, which is not useful in any way, shape or form. I promise you it's going to show you a bunch of junk. What you want to do is click on this box up here. So for instance, if you came here because your build recommended lava foot soup, it's a very 
popular stamina food. Lava, foot. Okay, so we have the recipe and the food itself. You don't want to buy the recipe, especially as a new player. The food itself is very cheap. So we're going to we're going to click on that so that it puts it in quotes, right? That means it is typed right. You don't have any typos because what are the odds you're going to type lava foot soup dash and dash salt? Right? You know, who's going to type it like that? Who's going to remember all that, right? So just start typing it and then use the autofill to click and that way, you know, Boom, there it is. These are being sold at 250 a pop, right? And my add-ons telling me that they generally go for 187 to 233. There's great, like I mentioned, there's some really good add-ons for this game. Some of the best add-ons are the ones that help you with guild traders and knowing if you're being ripped off or not. I have these all in my written guide for my add-ons. Make sure you check that out. It's in the description down below. If you're on PC, make sure to use the add-ons I recommend. They're gonna save you a ton of heartache and a ton of money in the long run, I promise you. And a ton of time. If you're on console, you know, good luck because you don't have add-ons. That's how you use a guild trader. That's where you find the guild traders at the scale on top of the tabard, not the scale without the tabard. Those are just general NPC merchants they're selling. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, furnishing. Sometimes it's really basic recipes, you know, random stuff like that. Okay, so that's how you buy from guild traders. How about how do you sell on a guild trader? Well, that's a great question. You're going to come over here to the bank. Remember how I said you had to join a trading guild that had a guild trader. So first you would do that. You would go to the guild list. You would click, you know, uh, guild finder. Then you would browse guilds, click trading, has trader. And um, you would have to find a guild that actually has one of those trading spots. That guild, that little NPC I was just talking about, there was a guild out there that bid millions of gold to have that NPC for one week. And they have to rebid every single week. This is ESO's gold sink, if you will. And there's hundreds of those NPCs located in the game. Every single zone has a batch of guild traders in it, right? And so there's tons of them out there. It's a fragmented auction house, basically. Uh, it is my least favorite part of Elder Scrolls online. I, I would much rather have one centralized auction house. I go, I talk to one NPC, I search for the item, it shows up, I buy it, I'm done. Uh, rather than going to an NPC, searching and being like, I don't know if this is a good price, then checking the next one, check the next one, right? Because you have to check multiple ones to make sure you're not getting ripped off. But you know, it is what it is. That's the that's the guild trading system that's in here. That's the auction house system that exists. Um, ESO is a great game, but no game's perfect. And so I would say this is probably my least favorite part of ESO. Uh, but anyway, I digress. We get back to it. So how do you sell on a guild trader? So if you're in a trading guild that has a guild trader, uh, what you're going to do is come to the bank. You're going to click guild store. Then down here, make sure you choose the guild that has the guild trader. I'm in five guilds, right? Uh, but only one of the guilds I'm in, Spicy Life, has a guild trader. So I accept. And then I click sell. And from here, I can choose the item I want to sell. So like this ring right here, my add-on is telling me this is going for around 5,700 gold to 7,200 gold. So I could put that there and say 5,700 gold, right? And boom, I could list it. And so the house is going to take 399 gold. My profit is going to be 5,200 gold, right? Very, very insignificant item. Um, I could also sell, if I wanted to make more money, I could sell like cosmetics, right? Like motifs. Like down here, I have one that's 33,000. I have a lot of really cheap ones in my inventory that I need to get rid of. I'll do that after this video, right? You can sell stuff on here to make money. So right now, for example, I'll list this one, 33,000. So I'm going to put it to 32,000. I'm going to just undercut just a little bit. Uh, I don't really need the money all that much anyway. And uh, I just want to get it out of my inventory and into the hands of someone that's going to enjoy it, right? So boom, there we go. We're going to sell it. And now when somebody buys that item, that money will come to me in the mail. Uh, all I'll have to do is click on this button down here. Um, <laughs> it would be in my mail. There would be a new piece of mail and it would say, uh, oh, right here, I have one item sold, right? This is one that sold four days ago, 3,600 gold. And I just grab that and delete that. Uh, that's So that's how you sell on the auction house. You got to be in a trading guild that has a guild trader. Then you come to the bank, you go to the guild store, you click sell, you list your items for whatever price you want to and you're good to go. It's a little bit convoluted. I know it's not my favorite part of ESO, but it gets the job done. And hey, who knows? Maybe someday we see them do a massive revamp on this system so that we have a more centralized trading system. That's a lot easier for new players to access. 
All right, the next thing that we're gonna go over is cosmetic customization, how to do it, how it works, and why it is so amazing in Elder Scrolls Online. Cosmetic customization is something that ESO does better than just about any other MMO out there. I mean, honestly, I can't think of one that really has the level of customization that ESO has. Uh, Final Fantasy comes close, WoW comes close, but both of those systems don't have a lot of the options that you do in Elder Scrolls Online, and it's certainly not as uh, conveniently, uh, I don't know, laid out. You know, the Glamour system is kind of clunky. The Transmodel system is really nice, but it doesn't have quite as many options as the ESO outfit station does. So this is one thing that ESO does really, really well. And here's what. So at the outfit station, uh, you'll see, well, let's start with dyes. Here's all the dyes that you can have in ESO. This is every die in the game right now. You can sort it by rarity if you're a monster, or you could sort it by hue, you know, if you're someone with like, you know, a bit sane. So this puts all your reds together, you know, your yellow yellows, your greens, your blues, purples, right, and so on. So this makes it much easier to pick the color you're looking for when you're trying to put a look together. And it tells you if you don't have a die unlocked, it tells you why. So Mudcrab Maroon says unlocked by the Chitin Accumulator Achievement. And by the way, all these dies are unlocked by achievements. You earn these dies. You don't have to buy them. You earn them by getting achievements throughout the game. Sometimes it's from doing a dungeon, sometimes from a trial, sometimes from a quest. It just depends on the die. But if you right click on it and you can view the achievement and it tells you what you have to do for this one i am i need to collect these very rare trophies um and the gossamer winglet is the one i don't have i've spent a bit of time trying to get this damn thing and let me tell you what it hasn't dropped and I'm never going to use this color, so I am not very motivated to keep trying. So that's all the dyes, and then you can apply those dyes over here to a piece of gear. So if I wanted to put this, whatever is the faded Dwemer Squalor Red, right? I can put this all over this gear, right? Uh, on these dye channels. Each piece of gear has up to three different dye channels that you can customize, or you could just randomize your dyes. You don't know what you want to put on. You're looking for a new look. You're not sure what to go. You can start by randomizing. I always start by randomizing dyes and gear until I, I see something that look, like inspires me, right? A combination or something. You know, unfortunately, I hate everything that I've seen so far here. So I'm going to go back to my default look. We're going to keep this one. And then you've got the armor styles here. You can see all of the helmet motifs I've found. So in WoW, you find transmogs. In Final Fantasy, you get your glams, right? In ESO, you get motifs. They look like this. It's little pieces of paper. And when you consume this item, you learn it and then it appears in your list, right? You've got head ones, shoulders, chest, hands, waist, legs, feet, right? Every piece of gear. And your weapons. So you find each one of these was a motif that I found out in the world. And there are tons of them. You can see there's just so much cosmetic customization. Look at that. Look at that. It's, uh, you know, there's so many options. Some are amazing looking. Some are hideous. Some are beautiful. And just like a lot of MMOs, you know, you've got some of them that are just really high res, beautiful looking. And then you've got some old base game ones and you put it on and you're like, wow, I wish they would uh, update this look, right? So there's those. And then again, you can randomize, you know, and here's just a bunch of rents. So you can just see how funky and how out there and cool some of them can be. The game has a lot of different looks you can have. All right, we'll get rid of that. And uh, yeah, so you can go through here and you can mix and match and choose them all and come up with a look that is very, very unique to you. Same with weapons. Weapons look really cool. Now, unfortunately, the coolest weapons are oftentimes sold in the cash shop. However, you can get some pretty neat looking weapons from the game as well. The two I'm wearing right now, these are cash shop. You can tell because of all the day glow, all of this, you know, uh, particle effects. If you see particle effects, that's generally cash shops. Now I'm going to put two non cash shop items on, right? So these are two non cash shop items. So the fire that was coming off of it, that was my fire enchant. That'll happen every once in a while, even on a, you know, base game item, you'll see a little bit of fire coming off of it, but see how these don't glow. Um, that's because they are not cash up weapons. What else do we got? So that's weapons, that's armor, that's dies. And then one of the things that ESO has that other games really don't have on this level is they have skins. So you can come in here. I'll put on a costume so you can see my skin. Let's go with Nordic. Now this is a skin I'm wearing right now. So if I take this skin off, skins, Here's what my character normally looks like, right? This is just the default dark elf skin. And uh, I'm wearing this one to make him kind of have this glow where the part of the arm you can see through his costume. But I could also put this one up, put this one up, this one, right? There's so many really cool skins in ESO. A lot of hideous ones, a lot of epic ones, some heroic ones, um, some really, really cool variety and some really cool stuff the artists have come up with. It just blows me away, man. I love what they do in this game with the skins and, and the outfit station. Um, but that's not all you can customize, right? So you can get these skins. By the way, I would say, I don't know, maybe half of these I earned from the game and half of these I uh, got from the cash shop here. Uh, if you want to know which skins you can earn for free by playing the game, some of them are quite easy to get. I have 
have a guide on that. Be sure to check out the skins guide in my description down below if you want to do that. Same with personality, right? So right now I have the Talvani Magister. He looks like he's brooding and plotting, but maybe I want to be more, I don't know, a zombie. I can put this on and now my character looks like a zombie, right? So there's all these different personalities. Most of these personalities are crown sore. You had to buy these with cash, but some of them are earned from playing the game. Again, I have a video for that. So I'll link that in the description. You're probably noticing I have a video for literally everything in ESO. So if you're ever not sure about something, just search for lucky ghost and then the topic. And one of my guides will come up telling you exactly what you need to know. And there you go. That's a good example of how much customization the outfit station and your collections offers you. You've also got hats, hairstyles, head markings, facial hair, major adornments, minor adornments, body markings, you know, uh, you saw one of the costumes, the bather style, but they have like other stuff too, like this, if you want to completely transform your look, just lots of options in this game to really customize your look and really make it the way that you want to make it. All right, next up, we have fast travel. So in Elder Scrolls Online, you can fast travel anywhere, anytime. If you go up to a shrine and teleport to another shrine, it's free. However, if you don't go up to a shrine and you just elect to teleport somewhere, you'll see here the gold value is ticking down. Basically, if you fast travel back to back, there's a max value. And let's say that it's, uh, let's say it's 600 gold on your character, right? That number changes based on what you've invested in in your CP. But let's just say the max value is 600 gold if you've TP'd recently without going to a shrine. And then it'll count down from 600 down to the minimum value. And so it gets cheaper the longer it's been since you fast traveled without using a shrine. Now, if you run up to a shrine and then click on it to travel to another shrine, it's free. And it doesn't matter how often you do that. So let's just go ahead and do that. I'm going to teleport right now without using a shrine, which means it's going to skyrocket. The cost of my next one is going to go up to the max value. So if I were to teleport now, instead of being 100 and change, it's 590 gold, right? And it's starting to count down. It's getting cheaper the longer it's been for my last teleport. Now, if I and rather than opening my map and clicking on a shrine to teleport somewhere, if I just go up to a shrine, and I interact with it, I can teleport. See, there's no cost associated, so I could teleport for free. So as long as you go to the shrines and teleport, it's free. This is something a lot of new players miss. They don't realize that teleporting isn't, um, it doesn't cost anything. It can be free if you want it to. If you want to save a few seconds though, and just teleport from where you're standing rather than run back to a shrine, like maybe you're deep in a delve, well, you know, just teleport for free. Also, a little trick of the trade is you can open up your friends list and you can right click and you can travel to them and it'll take you to the nearest shrine to that person, which is always free. It's always free to travel to a friend. It's always free to travel to a guild. So I could open up this and I can travel to any member of my guild for free. Uh, so if you want to if you want to get out of where you're at and you want to get to a shrine, it'll boom. Then that'll drop you right next to a shrine when you land. And then you can use that shrine to teleport wherever you want for free again. Just, you know, it's a little bit of a double jump, but it saves you gold if um, maybe you're a new player and you don't have a lot of gold to spend on traveling like that. All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about is group content. Elder Scrolls Online has a few different types of group content. It's got dungeons, it's got arenas, and it's got trials. Trials are Elder Scrolls version of raid. So there's three different uh, difficulties for each type of content. There is normal, then there is veteran, and then sometimes there's even a hard mode difficulty. So if we open up our party finder here, so if you're on PC, you just go to P on your keyboard or you press this button right here if you're on console, right? And it opens up this menu. And then for dungeons, you just click dungeon finder, random normal dungeon and join the queue. And that'll automatically join you with other players. Make sure to choose your role first, right? You have to choose whether you're a tank, a healer, or DPS. Uh, I encourage you to pick a damage dealer if you're a damage dealer. And if you're not a tank, don't play as a tank. Uh, people really frown upon that. You will get some very nasty comments from players a lot of times. Um, but if you are going to tank, just make sure, you know, at least have a taunt. You know, if you're a decent player, you can get by as a tank. As long as you have a taunt and you're keeping the boss still so that the group can kill it. Really, um, you're doing a pretty good job as a tank. You know, assuming you're not just dying, uh, that's that's going to be solid, right? But if you're queuing as a DPS, that's the longest queue. If you're queuing as a tank, that's the shortest queue. And if you're queuing as a healer, it's almost as short as the tank, but not quite, right? So just be aware, DPS has the longest queue. Might take, uh, might take 10 minutes, it might take 45 minutes. You just never know. You could alternatively queue for a specific dungeon, like you're following one of my guides and it says, hey, you need this set and it drops in this dungeon. Well, then you can come into here. You can choose specific dungeon, queue up for that dungeon. Like if you want a monster set, well, you wait till you get to 160, which, well, you should start doing your random normals like as soon as you hit level 10, because at level 10, the only dungeon you're going to be able to do is the really easy ones here. Fungal, a Grotto, Spindle Clutch, 
right? Banish cells. These are your level 10 dungeons. They're very easy. It's impossible to fail, really. And so I encourage you to jump into the dungeons sooner rather than waiting until you're really high level. And then you might get a DLC dungeon down here as your first dungeon. And they're a lot more difficult, a lot more mechanic heavy. But really, anything on normal is going to be it's going to be a pushover. More than likely, there's going to be at least one person in your group that could have soloed the dungeon anyway. So your first time in there, it's OK if you're not great yet and nobody's going to care. Uh, they probably won't even notice, honestly. So don't worry about being a new player in ESO. We were all there once. Get in there. And uh, dungeons are the best place to get crafting materials, right? Because you get so much gear dumped on you and you can decon that at the end of the dungeon. So you get great experience, great crafting materials. You get a skill point. The first time you do each dungeon, you get so much value for your character, so much gains for your character for each dungeon you do the first time. So I highly encourage you to try to do every single dungeon at least once and definitely do one random normal dungeon a day if you can, if you have time, definitely do that. Uh, as for veteran dungeons, never do a veteran random unless you're really experienced and you know what you're doing and but there's really no reason because veteran you'll notice you get the exact same reward it's no different there's no point in queuing up for a random veteran it's just going to take a lot longer and be a lot harder unless you know you're at that point where you're ready for random veteran content which means you're over 160 and you have two five piece sets you have you know your whole build put together more or less you got a lot of your passives and at least 160 champion points right spec'd in that's when you can start queuing up for veteran before that there's no real reason and farm your gear definitely farm your gear in normal difficulty because because it's the same gear dropping in normal, literally this exact same gear. It's just a hundred times faster to farm it in normal. And since it might take you 10 or 15 runs of a dungeon to farm that set, you don't want to try to farm it in veteran where the dungeon runs take three times as long. You want to farm those 10 or 15 runs in normal where you smash through it, you get the gear and then boom, you can use that gear to conquer that veteran content when you're ready. OK, so that's dungeons. Then there's also trials. Now, trials are a little bit more complicated. You have to go to Craglorn, go to the town of Belkarth, right? Teleport to the shrine in Craglorn and look at zone chat. And you're basically going to just shout, hey, DPS looking for group for uh, normal Sunspire or normal Cloud Rest or whatever dungeon or whatever trial you're looking for, right? You come here and you shout for it. And that's uh, that's the best ESO has right now. There is no trial finder. You can't just click a button and join a group like you can for dungeons. Unfortunately, you've got to go to this zone and like shout in zone chat or respond to people in zone chat that are already shouting. Maybe they might be saying looking for DPS or looking for a tank and then you can respond to them. Hey, I want to go. And they might ask you, you know, what kind of experience do you have? You know, just make sure that you're qualified uh, just be ready for that okay uh, but if it's a normal dungeon most likely they won't ask any questions because normal dungeons are pushovers they're real easy they're they're meant for new players to go and farm their gears alternatively i would highly recommend if you find yourself really enjoying trials and you want to get into that scene join a trial guild they will set up like a schedule where they say you know every friday we're doing this and you can sign up to run it so on friday you know at six o'clock you already signed up you're going to be in the group that runs sunspire at six on friday like you know they're your name's on the list and they might have a group at six and a group at seven and you can pick the time that you want to go and the dungeon and the trial you want to go to really recommend joining a pve guild that does that kind of stuff if you want to get into that kind of stuff it's way better than standing in craig lauren trying to find a group of pugs so dungeons are four man content that's one tank one healer and two dps trials are two tanks two healers and eight dps generally now there's some flexibility there sometimes groups will elect to take one tank or sometimes there's content in trials where they take three tanks um, it just kind of depends on the trial and the group and how they want to set up for it. But on average, let's just say two tanks, two healers, eight DPS. And then the uh, arenas are going to be one tank, one healer and two DPS, much like the dungeons. The arenas are usually you stand in a room and then waves of enemies spawn and you just kill them. That's what an arena is in ESO for the most part. The exception being Vatashan Hollows. It's a solo arena that's more like a dungeon. It's a solo dungeon. You run through it and you kill bosses. Um, but the rest of the arenas right now, you spawn into a room and then waves of enemies come at you you kill them in the final waves of bot all right now let's talk about the gear cap because i've kind of touched on it a couple times in the video already but it's something that's really important to understand so let's dive into it head first here the gear cap in elder scrolls online is cp 160 so it's level 50 cp 160 if you look at any of my items right there it says ring of night terror and then right below it says level 50 cp 160 that is the max level that is likely to never change the only way this would change is if they got rid of the cp requirement altogether and they made the max level Level for gear level 50, which in my opinion they should do. The first 160 levels of like gear is so pointless because CP is account wide. So if you get a CP 149 item, you will never use it again because when you create a new character, that character will start at level one CP 800 
right? It never sees those lower CP levels again. You're going to get it to 50 and then you're going to put all your um, level 50 gear on it. That's CP 160. Uh, so uh, anyway, all that to say a uh, max level for gear is right now it's level 50 CP 160. So don't craft yourself gear until you're 160. You can, you know, there's no point in having like low CP gear and don't buy any gear that is below 160. So this is generally why people just kind of wear what they wear. They just wear what they find until 160. They might farm some low level sets. That way that you get them in your collections, because when you find something, you're later able to craft it using transmutes. So you can go farm it at like level 25 to level 50. And then once you hit CP 160, that's when you craft it at max level and you put it on. But don't invest in gear really until you hit 160. Okay, that's the takeaway from this. Get to 160. That's the max level for gear. Everything below that is literally garbage and nobody wants it. Oh, which, you know, reminds me, you're going to find a lot of gear as you play Elder Scrolls Online and you're going to wonder, is it worth saving? Is it worth keeping? Well, if it's a dungeon gear, you can't trade it unless it was to a person that was in the dungeon with you when it dropped. But if you trade it to them, then it doesn't get added to your collection. So more often than not, you're just going to keep it. You're going to decon it. That way you get the materials. We'll go into deconning in a little bit, but just know, you know, if you're wondering what to do with all that gear that you're finding, just deconstruct it so that you get the crafting materials that you'll later use to craft and upgrade gear. It is the circle of life. It's not that you're wasting this gear that you find. I know you're going to find this like purple ring or something and you're going to be like, oh man, oh, it's a purple item. I want to save it. It's it's so good. And and the truth of the matter is it's probably not. If it's a, if it's a CP 45 item or if it's a level 26 item, it, just deconstruct it. Take the materials and run. Nobody wants the low level gear. I promise you that. Okay. And then also while we're talking about gear, let's finish up the conversation on monster sets. So like we kind of touched on earlier, monster sets are two piece sets that you wear on your head and your shoulders. You get monster sets by going to a dungeon and killing the final boss in that dungeon. That's going to drop the helmet. The shoulder is going to drop from the undaunted pledges. So you're going to do undaunted pledges. Those are going to give you a currency called undaunted keys. You're going to take those keys. You're going to go to the undaunted enclave, which is this symbol right here in every faction city. So for instance, in this case, Elden Root, right? And then you go to Elden Root, you go to the undaunted enclave. There's going to be NPCs there that sell. Uh, there's three of them. Two of them are selling like all the base game shoulders. One selling all the DLC shoulders. And you just gamble for them there. There's two different coffers and you, you hope that you get the shoulder that you want in the weight that you want. It can be a little bit of an RNG nightmare sometimes, or sometimes you get lucky, you get what you want right off the bat. But yeah, so if I have a slime craw visage, then I go to an NPC there and I use my keys to gamble for the slime craw shoulders. Once I have both pieces, then I get the two piece set bonus, which is usually a really, really powerful set bonus. That's the great thing about monster sets is the one piece bonus is usually really powerful. Not a lot of things have a one piece bonus. Really, it's just mythic items and monster helmets. So mythic items and monster sets have a one piece bonus. Mythic items have really powerful one piece bonuses because that's all they are is a one piece set. And then monster sets have uh, the next most powerful one piece bonus. And the good thing is you can wear two different monster sets. So you could get two different one piece bonus from monster sets, whereas mythic items, you can only wear one at a time. Monster sets come and go from the meta. Sometimes we're using two pieces of a monster set in our build. Sometimes we're only taking advantage of the one piece bonus. It kind of just depends on the patch. So, you know, refer to a written guide if you're curious about what the meta is right now. I've got tons of build guides again linked in the description if you're curious about those. Now let's talk about perfected gear. You'll notice that some gear says it's perfected. And earlier I said, uh, dungeons drop the same gear in normal as they do in veteran. And that's true. Trials, however, drop perfected gear. So in a normal trial, it would drop relic and jack. And then in a uh, veteran cloud rest, it would drop relic and perfected jack. And basically these have a, they have one extra stat line on them. Instead of having one five piece bonus, the perfected gear that drops from veteran trials has two five piece bonuses. Usually the second one that you, that, you know, that comes from perfected is, uh, it's a stat like 1000 max stamina. Like we have here, it's good for maybe a couple percent damage, you know? So instead of doing a hundred thousand damage, your character is now capable of a hundred and two thousand damage. It's a very small increase to your character's power, but it is an increase to your character's power. So generally you're going to want to farm your trial gear on normal difficulty first. And then once you have that put together, then you can go ahead and start farming your perfected gear in veteran. Once you're ready for that veteran trials, especially veteran DLC trials are the hardest content in the game. You know, that's very difficult, especially for new players. So don't expect to be jumping into veteran DLC trials until you're 
at minimum 300 CP and most likely a group won't take you till you're more like six, seven, 800 CP and putting out maybe a 60, 70 or 80 K parse. So it's going to be a while before you're farming perfected gear, unless you've got some friends helping you out. Okay. That's just normal part of the way it goes. So get your normal gear. Um, and don't feel like that's a waste of time to farm that out. It's going to be very, very good. Almost nearly as, as effective as the perfected gear. Anyway, much like trials have perfected gear arenas also have perfected gear. So if you do the four man arena on veteran, you can get perfected weapons at the end rather than just the normal ones. And solo arenas also have perfected gear. So if you run Vodashan Hollows on veteran, you get a perfected weapon from that as well. Again, it's just one extra stat line. It's usually not a big bonus, but it's a measurable bonus. So it's that last inch of power that we seek out when we're building our characters. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about PVP a little bit. So in Elder Scrolls Online, there's three types of player versus player. We've got, first of all, we've got the battlegrounds here. So the battlegrounds is 4v4. V4. You can open up your party menu, same place as the dungeon finder, right? And you can queue into the battlegrounds here, solo or group. So you can queue in solo or you can group with some friends and queue in as a group. That's up to you. And you join the queue and it's going to be four V4 V4. So three teams of four going at it. Uh, that's the battleground. Alternatively, you could go to Cyrodiil. Cyrodiil is where it's faction versus faction versus faction. So you've got uh, Ebonar Pact is red. Then you've got Aldemary Dominion, which is yellow. And then you've got Daggerfall Covenant, which is blue. So these three factions are always fighting, you know, 24 seven in here, waging war on each other. And the goal of which is to capture these keeps here. These six keeps in the middle are what determine who the emperor is in Cyrodiil. It's the most coveted achievement in Cyrodiil really is getting to be emperor while you're there. So in order to become the emperor in Cyrodiil, you have to have the most alliance points earned in that campaign in your faction, right? So if you're EP, you have to have the most alliance points in your entire faction. Uh, your faction has to capture all six of these middle keeps that go around this water here. Once you capture all six of those, boom, the game will automatically make the person with the most alliance points in that faction, the emperor, right? Until another faction dethrones them by taking those six center keeps themselves. While you are the emperor, you have massive stat buffs. You're like basically a boss roaming around Cyrodiil, you know, taking down armies and almost by yourself at times. So it's a lot of fun to get. If you ever happen to get that, it's pretty hard to get because there's a lot of people going for it at all times, but it's pretty cool. Um, That's Cyrodiil. And the way you get to Cyrodiil, unlike other places in the game, you can't just teleport into Cyrodiil. You have to queue into Cyrodiil. So you you press L if you're on PC. It's the Alliance War. And it's this button here if you're on console. And then you go to this button up here. It says campaigns. Click that. And then you can choose a campaign to join in Cyrodiil. Grey Host is the Alliance locked one, which means you can only like if you join Grey Host on your EP tune, then none of your AD or DC tunes can go into Grey Host. You can only go into this in one faction. So all of your EP tunes would be able to go in there, your Ebonar Pack tunes, but none of your other tunes that were any other faction could go. This, you know, this way you can't uh, play both sides in that one, right? Uh, the rest of them are not alliance locked. So any tune could go into any one of these if they wanted to. And you can see here how many people are in them. These ones are quite empty, right? Then you've got standard, which is pop locked for a couple of the factions and like just alliance locked. This one's the most popular one. Usually there's a lot of people in that one keeping it nice and full. Cyrodiil can be quite laggy, especially during prime time. So if you go there when nobody else is there, that's simultaneously the best and the worst experience. It's the best performing, um, but also it can be hard to find like good engaging battles. So uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag in Cyrodiil in terms of performance and experience. Uh, if you go there and it's just too laggy, that's when you would fall back to like battlegrounds or maybe even Imperial City. So Imperial City, same thing. In order to get to Imperial City, you have to queue. You right. You open up the same menu, the Alliance War menu, and you come in here and you pick Imperial City. Now, Imperial City is usually pretty dead outside of a couple of events a year that push everybody in there. So if you go into Imperial City and you don't really run into a lot of people, don't be surprised. That's not terribly uncommon, unfortunately. Imperial City is a PvPve zone. So you can go in there and you can farm Telvar by killing NPCs, or you can go in there and you can farm Telvar by killing people that were farming Telvar, right? When you kill someone, you take half their Telvar and vice versa. If they kill you, they take half of your Telvar. So so, you know, if you go in there, keep your head on a swivel, be careful and just know that you can bank your Telvar. So if you go in there and you get like 10,000 Telvar, you can go back to your base, go to your bank in your base and bank that Telvar so that when you die, you don't lose it. If your Telvar is in your bank, you don't lose it. If your Telvar is on your person and you die you'll lose half of it. So very important to know about Imperial City. A lot of people lose a lot of the Telvar the first time they're in there and not knowing that they could have banked it and kept it safe. 
If you're curious about how much Telvar you have on you, you can always open up your inventory, go to currency, and you can see it right here, Telvar Stones. This character is carrying 4,500 on him. Uh, not a lot, but not a little, you know? So it's a decent amount. I might take that out with me and try to take advantage of a multiplier. You get more Telvar per kill based on a multiplier. So the more you're carrying on you when you kill things, the more Telvar you get for killing them. It's kind of a risk reward thing. Uh, but if you die, you lose 50% of it. So, you know, it's, it's, your, it's up to you how much of a risk you take and how much reward you try to go for out there. All right, next, let's go over Combat in Elder Scrolls Online. So, in Combat in Elder Scrolls Online, you have three basic functions that you need to be taken care of. One is you've got a dodge roll that lets you avoid damage. Boom. So we dodge rolled that attack. Some attacks will be more forecast than others. Uh, there's usually going to be a red circle or a red cone or something like on the ground, like this one here, telling you, hey, that's bad, get out of it. You can dodge out of it. You can also choose to block incoming attacks. This is going to cost stamina every time you block an attack. When you run out of stamina, well, one, you won't be able to dodge anymore. You won't be able to block anymore and you won't be able to sprint, right? Stamina is used for all of those things. So it's very important that you don't run out of stamina if you can help it. You can get stamina back by using a stamina potion like this. Boom, there it goes up or by heavy attacking your enemy. If you're using a melee weapon, if you're using a staff, when you heavy attack, you'll get magic back. So that's that's blocking. That's how that works. It's a game of resource management. Uh, some attacks you'll want to block, some you'll want to dodge roll. It kind of depends on the attack. And really, you just learn by engaging with the mobs and you'll start to see certain types of mobs. You have attacks you definitely want to dodge and some uh, have attacks you want to block. Uh, then we also have dodge roll, right, which costs stamina. Now, the thing to know about uh, dodge roll that a lot of people don't notice is see these lines under my feet. If I dodge roll again while those lines are still there, the dodge roll costs infinitely more. Boom. See how it's chewing up my stamina? I dodge again. I'm out of stamina in like four dodge rolls. Uh, now, if I wait for those lines to be gone to dodge roll that were on my feet and I dodge roll, look, it, it's like a tiny little chunk of my stamina, right? But if I dodge roll again back to back, it starts to cost more each time. See how it's boom. That one was like half of my stam bar. So you don't want to dodge roll in quick succession. It gets uh, more expensive each time until it's just eating like huge chunks of your bar. So you want to dodge roll and then wait, right? See how I have a lot of iframes there. If even if you dodge roll a little early when they when he throws his attack at you, you're still going to like you get a, a second and a half of iframes basically. OK, so watch. I'll dodge roll early like that. He did a step back there because we dodge. It's really forgiving. I'm intentionally trying to dodge early um, and then you get your stamina back by heavy attacking. See, it starts going up like that. Or if you have a good build put together, if you're following one of my build guides, you will almost never need to heavy attack. That's really, if you're having to do a lot of heavy attacking on a build, it's generally a sign that the build um, is lacking in sustain somewhere or possibly that you just don't have all of your passives and all of your champion points yet. But generally, once you get a build put together, uh, you shouldn't need to be doing a lot of heavy attacking. And that's basically how the combat in ESO works. You're going to be using light attacks to generate ultimate. You're going to be using dodge roll to avoid, you know, abilities. Uh, you're going to jump out of the red. If you see it standing in red, will get you killed in veteran. In normal, you can get away with a lot, um, but it also creates a lot of bad habits, letting people stand in the red without dying. Uh, they learn very quickly in veteran that that's not OK. You can block attacks by, you know, using your block button, and that's going to mitigate a lot of the damage, but at the cost of your uh, stamina, right? So it eats up your stamina when you block. And also you'll notice if I use my stamina and I block, Stamina doesn't regen while blocking. So really bad for a tank to constantly block when they don't need to because their stam's not going to go up. So they're going to be losing stam when the enemy hits them, but they're not going to be getting it back while they're blocking. So they can find themselves out of stamina when they need it the most, when they have big heavy attacks coming in that's going to one-shot them, right? Because they they blocked, they overblock. Um, being a good tank is all about learning how to manage your resources, knowing which attacks to block and knowing which which attacks to let hit you and just let your healer heal you through a light attack, right? It's not going to do any damage to you. You don't need to block that. It's going to tickle. So your healer will heal you. Conserve your stamina for when you need it for that heavy attack that will one shot you. And same goes for, you know, DPS and healers. There's a lot of times where you need to know how to manage your stamina to keep yourself alive. You need to have that stamina available for that dodge roll when you need it the most or you need to have that salmon available for the block when you need it the most all right next let's talk about synergies healers are going to be giving out a lot of synergies tanks are going to give out a lot of synergies dps are going to give out synergies basically synergies are 
They're the result of certain skills. Some skills have synergies attached to them. So for instance, if I use this skill, you'll see on the bottom there, it says use X to use Grave Robber. Press X to use Grave Robber. So if I press it, that extra effect happens. This skill, when someone synergizes with it, it shoots out a massive wave of damage hurting the enemies nearby. Different synergies have different effects. Sometimes the synergy will give you a buff for 15 seconds that makes you do more damage. Sometimes the synergy will give you health. And depending on what passives you have, your synergy is going to give you resources back, like those undaunted passives that cause synergies. Every time you grab any synergy, it's going to give you health, magicka, and stamina back. Really, really critical to your sustain in group content. So group content, uh, your healers are going to be giving out a lot of synergies so that you can be constantly grabbing them so that you're getting resources back. This is huge for the DPS and their sustain. So they're not running out of stamina or magicka. And it's huge for the tank, especially. So he's not running out of sustain when he's trying to fight for his life against the mob that he's holding aggro on. Now, this leads into consumables. Consumables are all about giving you more sustain. When you hear someone say uh, it has good sustain or this helps your sustain, that means it helps your ability not to run out of your primary resources, whatever those are. If you're a stamina tune, it helps you not run out of stamina. Or if you're a magicka, it helps you not run out of magicka, right? That's what people refer to when they say it has good sustain. So if you run out of sustain in ESO, it usually means if you're a DPS that you're not doing any damage or if you're a tank that you're dead. So you don't want to have bad sustain on your build or in your group. And one of the primary ways, maybe the primary way that you improve your sustain in ESO is through consumables. Consumables in Elder Scrolls Online are not optional. They're not there as like, oh, here's extra 1% buff to your character. No, more like consumables are an extra 30% buff to your character, right? Because food like Lava Foot Soup, very, very popular consumable. One of the ones I always recommend in a lot of my builds is because one, you can wear it from level one to level 160 to level 3,600, right? It's a food that scales for you all the way from level one. Uh, a lot of foods have level requirements on them, but not lava foot. And it happens to be amazing. It gives you a 5,000 stamina or just about and almost 500 recovery. Uh, so that increased stamina and that increased stamina recovery means it's so much harder for you to run out of stamina while you're using this food. Whereas without it, it's very, very easy. You will run out of sustain really fast in content if you're not running some kind of food that's helping your sustain or if you're not in a group where a healer or tank is helping with your sustain, right? So food is a big deal, both for your damage and for your sustain of your resource. Likewise, potions. Potions are another part of this game that new players overlook for far too long, usually. Uh, potions in Elder Scrolls Online are not optional. They are very, very important to your build and to your sustain. The game is built assuming that you are going to use food and you're going to use potions. And if you don't use those things, you're going to run out of stamina or you're going to run out of magicka or both. Right. So very important that you use these until you do your sustain is going to be handicapped. And so is your build. So you got your basic stamina potions, which drop off of mobs. They're these little green ones. These are great for stam tunes. And you got your little basic blue ones, Essence of Magicka. These drop off of mobs as well. And these are perfect for using when you're a new player right? They're very cheap. You can buy them at guild traders for next to nothing. And it helps you get in the habit of using them every 45 seconds while in combat, which is what you should do. These are meant to be used on cooldown as soon as they come off of cooldown in combat. And that's how you prevent yourself from running out of resources in those dungeons and in those trials is spamming these potions when you're in combat. You don't have to worry about using them when you're out of combat, but when you're in combat, absolutely use them. And then once you get to the big boy content, right, the veteran content where it's not just it's not enough to do. It's not enough to have a little better sustain. You need a lot more sustain and you need more damage. Then boom, you pull out something like essence of weapon power potions. These are huge. First of all, it gives you a 20 percent weapon damage buff. So boom, that's 20 percent. That's so huge. It also gives you major savagery, which gives you extra crit chance and it gives you stamina and it gives you 100 percent uptime on all of these things. So the buffs last for 47 seconds. The cooldown is is 45 seconds, right? So you have 100% uptime on these buffs if you're using them properly. So potions and food and ESO, long story short, very important. Don't ignore them. Uh, as soon as you start doing group content, make sure that you are getting in the habit of using these things on cooldown. Now for questing and stuff like that, uh, the battles are dispersed enough where, you know, you'll probably be fine getting by without them. But once you get to group content, when you're constantly in action, constantly in battle, it's going to really help to get in the habit of using these potions. When it comes to food and potions, you can put them on your quick slot wheel, which is what I highly recommend that you do because you're going to be using them, like I said, constantly and you don't want to have to come in here, open three menus, dive into three different layers of those menus and then dig out and double click on it, right? So what you want to do is open your menu and then drag the potion on here and then boom. Now 
you can see every time I press Q, I'm going to be using that potion. If I want to change that out, or maybe what another good thing to do, another good strategy is to have both your valuable potions and your cheap potions, right? So if you're doing something easy, like a normal dungeon, you can use your cheap potions. And then if you go into a veteran dungeon, boom, you slot those valuable potions, right? You don't want to use these expensive potions on questing content, right? Because it's so easy. That's overkill. It's a waste of your money. But for the hard content, absolutely. Okay, next up, we have the transmute station. There's a couple of really, really powerful things you can do with the transmute station. So uh, this is quickly going to become one of your favorite things in ESO once you get used to it. The first thing that you can do at the transmute station is retrate items. So if you have a very valuable weapon, like you've golded it out, right? But you want to change the trait right now. This one's Nern honed, but let's say I wanted it to be precise. I could come in here and I could use 50 transmutes to change that trait rather than going out and farming it all over again and hoping it drops in precise, which would be a pain in the butt, right? This is a crafted set, so I would actually just craft it anyway. Maybe a bad example, uh, but like the Coral Riptide Dagger, this is a trial set. You would have to farm this in a trial. It dropped and charged, right? Charge is pretty useless for me. Maybe I want precise or maybe I want Nern Honed. I could do that with this dagger. I could retrade it. No problem and have it the right trait for a cost of 50 transmutes. In order to retrade it to Nernhound, I would have had to have researched Nernhound from a dagger. I'll talk about how to do that in this section coming up here next when I get into crafting. But just know that in order to retrate something, you need two things. One is you need the material that it takes to retrade it. In this case, it's this one right here. And you need to have researched the ability to turn it into that trait. So those are the two steps. OK, oh, I guess three, you need the transmute crystals, right? So you need those three things. You need the knowledge, you need the item, and then you need the transmute crystals, right? And then you can change the trait on an item. Now, the other thing that you can do at a transmute station is you can reconstruct items. This is relatively new. Well, it's not that new anymore, but it was one of the best things that they added to Elder Scrolls Online, period. It's your sticker book right here. It's got every time you find a piece of gear and you bind it to yourself, either by deconstructing it, by selling it to an NPC or by equipping it, right, or just right click it and bind it. You can do all of those things. Anything you do to basically prevent another person from binding it to themselves. So anything you do to make it bound to your account or to prevent someone else from having it, will bond, it'll put it in your sticker book, essentially. That's the way to think about it. Once it's in here, that means you've collected it and you can recraft it anytime you want. So you can deconstruct it. And then if you ever decide, oh man, I need that set again, it's good again. You know, they just buffed it. You can come in here and you can just click on the helmet. You can choose the quality. You can just choose the trait and then you can just hit reconstruct and boom, you're crafting that item. The way this works, is if you have collected the entire set, right? If you've collected all of the weapons and all of the armor and all the jewelry, it only costs 25, right? So 25 transmutes. Or if you've only collected one piece of gear, like I have here, I have this perfected coral riptide ring. I've only collected one, so it costs 75. Here, I've collected the whole set, so it's 25, right? So it's a scale, it's a sliding scale. If you've collected two, it would be instead of 75, it would be, let's say, 70, right? And it would get cheaper to craft it the more pieces of it that you have found. So ideally, you'll wait until you've farmed a bunch of that set so that you're not burning through all of your transmutes to craft it. So wait until you farmed all the pieces you need and then maybe even a few more. So you're getting closer to 25 per piece when it comes to crafting because it's going to cost you transmutes, right? And transmutes to see how many you have, open your inventory, click on the currency tab right here. And it says I have 642 out of a thousand. So you'll burn through them really fast once you start putting a build together, right? Because it's going to cost five pieces of gear. So that's five times 25 at the minimum. And and then another five piece set. So that's another five times 25, right? And then uh, maybe a back bar weapon, maybe a mythic item, right? And you can see that 25 a piece starts to add up really fast. And that's the cheapest they could be, right? You might be crafting it at 50 a piece because you didn't farm the whole set. So some incentive to farm everything and have them all ready to go. But yeah, this was a great addition to the game, this sticker book. And it makes it so that once you found it, you never have to farm that set again. So once you farm a set, even if you deconstruct it to make room in your bank, to make room in your inventory because that set got nerfed and it's not good anymore, if Zoss ever makes it good again, you can just come in here and recraft it instantly. You don't have to go run that dungeon 20 times again to get that set, which feels fantastic. As I mentioned, this costs transmutes. So what are transmutes? How do you get them? Transmutes are earned in a few different ways in ESO. The primary way to earn transmutes is going to be from the dungeon finder. You just click dungeon finder, random normal, join queue. When you finish the dungeon, you will at the end get 10 transmutes. You can do this on every character every day, one time. So if you have five characters, you can get 50 transmutes a day, right? 
It only works on your first random normal of the day per character. So if you have 10 characters, you could get 100 transmutes per day, right? You, I mean, really, your sanity is the limit there. So as much as you want to farm it, you can. And uh, you can rack up a lot of it fast that way. If you're more of a PvP kind of guy, you can go to Cyrodiil and you can get tier one in Cyrodiil and that's going to give you 50 transmutes. But those campaigns last as long as almost, what, a month? So if the campaign just started, you might not want to wait a month for your transmutes, right? So that that can be a good way to kind of go in there and get tier one if you enjoy PvP or if you don't need the transmutes anytime soon, you can go in there and get tier one on a few tunes, right? And that would be 150 transmutes that you would eventually get when that campaign ended and the rewards were sent out. That's a great way to do it as well. To see what tier you are, you just look right here. You would go to the overview tab of the campaigns and you would see you are, well, right now I'm tier zero. I have not PVP'd this campaign. If I wanted to, I would have to go into Blackreach. You must go into your home campaign to increase your tier. Just a heads up, if I was to go into Greyhost and PVP in there, I would not get any experience towards my campaign. It has to be the one that I set as my home campaign, which right now is Blackreach. The way you change your home campaign is you click on it, right click on it if you're on PC, right click on it and set it as your home standard is my home now i could change it to the alliance locked one if i wanted to and then i would go in there so just make sure you set one as your home and then go in and farm your ap which will give you tier points you can get this leveled up by doing literally anything in there that involves gaining ap so killing players but more importantly capturing keeps capturing resources. Those are going to be the things that really chunk this up uh, in significant amounts. And you can get it done as fast as 45 minutes, you know, 30 minutes if uh, things are going really, really in your favor. But you could also go in there for an hour and not getting any AP at all. You know, it's a crapshoot when you're in Cyrodiil. You never know what kind of a day it's going to be in there for you. All right. Now, like I mentioned, let's talk about those crafting stations. So crafting stations are pretty huge in ESO. You're going to use these for a lot of things and they can do a lot for you. Some obvious and some not so obvious. So let's take a look at, for example, here's the stations that you have. You have the blacksmithing station. This is where you craft metal gear, right? So your heavy armor or your melee weapons, that kind of thing. You've got the woodworking station. This is where you craft bows, shields, because in ESO shields are wood. It's sword and board, not sword and shield sword and board. So your shields are made out of wood in ESO. Just a little clarification. I know a lot of people go to the metal station, you know, myself included. I went there every time for a long time looking for my shield and I, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's it's wood. The shield's made of wood. Okay, so in here, this is where you craft your bows, your staves, and your shield. Then you've got your clothing station. This is where you craft all of your light and medium armor. So cloth, right, leather, that kind of thing. Then you've got your jewelry crafting station, which is where you would obviously guess uh, your jewelry is crafted, right? Then beyond that, you have a cooking fire like this one or like this one right here. It looks different depending on where you're at, but there's cooking fires and you can interact with these and you can craft your consumables your meals and your drinks. Then there is the enchanting table. The enchanting table is where you craft glyphs to enchant your weapons and your gear with. And then your alchemy station, which is where you craft your potions and your poisons. Okay, so lots of different crafting benches in Elder Scrolls Online. So let's talk about the crafting stations that involve crafting gear. If you interact with the blacksmithing station, you've got some tabs here. This is what we're gonna clarify. So the first one is refine. Do not touch this tab. Do not touch this tab for a long time. Don't touch this tab on your main, don't touch it on your alts, right? You have the option to refine here, right? It'll tell you like, hey, you can refine these things if you click on them and turn them into better materials. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's a trap. OK, let me explain why you want to max out one of your crafters abilities. There's a passive right under blacksmithing. It's called metal extraction maximizes the chances of extracting blacksmithing ingredients that allows the refining of the most powerful tempers from raw materials. So you want to pick a character that's going to be your crafter. Typically, the smart thing to do is to make it your main. There's a lot of reasons for your main being your crafter. One, your main is going to have more skill points than you need. Like you can see here, I've got three builds on this character and I still have 46 points left over and he's maxed out his crafting, right? Because your main is going to inevitably find way more skill points than he needs. There's going to be one from every dungeon, trial, arena. There's going to be three from every zone, right? There's going to be six from every zone sky shards, right? So you just inevitably end up with literally, I think I have 480, 450, 480 uh, skill points on this character way more than I need, right? So maxing out crafting on my main was perfect because now I don't have to log out of this character and into a crafter every time I want to upgrade one of my many pieces of gear, right? Or if I want to, let's say, retrade a piece of gear, upgrade a piece of gear, craft potions, craft food, right? I don't have to take off that piece of gear, put it in the bank, log out, switch over to the other character, grab it, upgrade it, put it back in the bank, log out, 
log back into this character, grab it out of the bank, put it on, right? Like there's just so many unnecessary steps if you put your crafter on an alt. It's not the end of the world if you did it. And sometimes your main stops being your main and then your crafter ends up being your alt just because you changed mains. And there's nothing you can do about that. But in a perfect world, your crafter being your main is ideal. So yeah, as I was saying, don't refine until you've maxed metal extraction out, okay? Just like you don't wanna upgrade your gear from blue to purple and purple to gold until you've maxed out temper expertise, whatever the equivalent is for that weight of armor, right? So if you're wearing cloth armor, like leather or linen, right? Like if you're wearing a light armor or a medium armor, you need to max out uh, tanning expertise before you max out your gear, right? This is very, very important. Otherwise you're literally wasting hundreds of thousands of gold on your way to gold quality. And I'm not exaggerating. It's hundreds of thousands of gold that you're wasting in materials because it literally cuts the cost from 20 of the material to eight. So more than halved when, uh, when you have this, right? So you don't want to upgrade gear without getting your crafting done, okay? You can do like green to blue and you might even be willing to do blue to purple, right? Because those ingredients aren't that expensive. Uh, jewelry is expensive. Don't waste these. Get this one done. Get your plating expertise, right? Get that one done early. Do not upgrade jewelry without that. It's a uh, very expensive. Okay. So um, this is all kind of, man, this has been a tangent. I was trying to talk about crafting and I started giving out uh, really important advice about crafting instead, but make sure just the, the moral of the story though, is I know this is a lot of information. The moral of the story is don't start refining until you've maxed out your passives that improve the materials you get from refining. Because again, you're going to be throwing away hundreds of thousands or even millions of gold if you do this. So don't touch this tab until you maxed out that passive. And then also there's a CP one and it is called meticulous disassembly. So make sure you have this maxed out and slotted. Make sure you have the corresponding extraction passives maxed out. And then, and only then, you can start refining your different benches. Each bench has a refining of the materials for that bench, right? And you don't want to touch those unless you've maxed that out. So don't ever touch it on your alts, craft it, touch it on your crafter only, and only after you've got your passives leveled up. Otherwise, you're throwing away a ton of gold. Okay, so that's the first step. That's refining. So basically, when you're out there gathering materials in the world, you're getting these materials that you can refine and turn into materials that you can craft and upgrade with. The next tab is the crafting tab itself. This is where you can craft items. You can craft a dagger, right? And here you chose like the level. You never, ever, ever really want to craft anything that's not CP 160. Now, this is very important to notice, okay? I went all the way to the right, right? Boom. You would think this would be 160 because I hit all the way to the right. So it should be the max level. It's not. It's CP 150. There's, a, I guarantee you, there's a lot of people in the game running around right now with gear that is not max level because they didn't realize they maxed this out. But then there's this little button that pops up right here. Boom. Now it's 160. Now the gear is one. It's a lot more expensive to craft. It went from costing 10 Rubidite to costing 100, but it's also a lot more powerful as a result. So make sure if you craft something that you go all the way to the right and then you hit this little plus sign, it's really easy to miss that. Then you've got here, these are just styles. It just changes the way it looks. It doesn't change the way it performs. And you're likely going to override it with a motif at the outfit station so for this i wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about what you choose choose something that you have a lot of or that's really cheap or whatever and uh, just craft it in any style that doesn't really matter you're just gonna override it at the outfit station and then choose your trait okay so your trait like i said i have 33 of the nern crux so that i can make it nern honed or i have 1.1 thousand of decisive because i never make decisive stuff so you need these materials in order to pick the trait and you get these materials a lot of ways you get these materials by deconstructing items that had that trait things like that okay the next tab is going to be deconstruct this is where you deconstruct gear that you find to take the materials out of it that you can hopefully use to craft something else later and also deconstructing is what levels up your benches crafting doesn't really level your benches in eso not your armor benches all of your experience so right here in the top left you can see that my blacksmithing is level 50 right that is primarily earned by deconstructing heavy armor or weapons it's the deconstructing process that levels your bench and when you find one of these items with one of these symbols on it that means that's intricate that means you get increased inspiration. Inspiration is just crafting experience. It's just another name for crafting experience. So um, when I deconstruct these, I get mega crafting experience because they have the intricate thing on them, right? Mine's already maxed out. So when I deconstruct it, I just get the materials. I don't need the experience. I don't get any experience. It's maxed. So next, let's go to the improvement tab. Improvement is where you upgrade things. So if you find an item that's green, here is where you'll come to upgrade it to blue and then from blue to purple and from purple to gold. If I click on this coral riptide dagger, for instance, boom, it shows up here as purple. So I can upgrade it to purple. It's going to cost me four of my grain solvent. 
I have 3.1 thousand grain solvents. So I'm going to do that as an example here. I have this item locked, so it's making me type confirm. OK, I have it locked so I don't accidentally deconstruct it in the deconstruct tab. Oh, which reminds me, if you have an item that you find, right, like it's a piece of gear you want to save and you don't want to accidentally deconstruct it, make sure you right click it and lock. So I unlocked it. Now, when I go to deconstruct, look, it's there. It's very easy. I could accidentally decon it when I'm because you'll come here and you'll have 40 items to deconstruct. Very, very easy, right? After one dungeon, you'll have so much stuff to deconstruct. So you do two or three in a row and it's real easy to lose the good items. You know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you will. So make sure when you get an item you want to hold on to that it's important to you or that you're wearing, right? Always right click it, lock it. That way it doesn't show up here anymore. And then you can still upgrade it, but it's going to say, okay, make sure you want to make this change to this item. It's a locked item. So confirm, you just type that in and then you can do it. So here you can see this cost eight, eight of my tempering alloy to make this item. Tempering alloy is one of the cheapest materials for going to gold. Let's see how much that costs. Tempering alloy. OK, these are selling for 16 to 20,000 a piece. I'm using eight of those instead of 20, right? So I'm saving 12 times 16 to 20,000 massive savings by upgrading my crafting passives before upgrading the item. OK, that's nothing, though. Look at this. What about jewelry? Let's look at chromium plating. This is selling for 301 to 376,000, an average of 345,000. OK, so if I was to improve that item, it's it's either eight or 10 to upgrade it. If you don't have that passive, right, we're saving four times 345,000 on the low end. One point three million gold being saved per piece of jewelry. If we upgrade the passives before we upgrade the item, right? That's just one piece of jewelry. We're wearing three and we're changing them uh, like every other patch, right? So one, uh, this is why we almost never take our jewelry to gold. First of all, I don't recommend it. I'm running purple jewelry right now and uh, it's fine. You know, I can do every bit of content in the game with purple jewelry. I have done every bit of content in the game with purple jewelry. It is not necessary to upgrade your jewelry to gold in ESO. It's really not. It's not worth it. You're you get some decent damage gains, like let's say a few percent, but yeah, it's going to cost you millions, right? And it might only be relevant set for three months. And then, you know, three months later, you're having to do it all over again. So upgrade your jewelry last, upgrade your weapons first, upgrade your monster set second, your body armor third and your jewelry lasts okay jewelry lasts okay so that's the let's see so that's improvement and that's how you improve and how you get the materials to improve right from deconstructing things and then you've got research so research is if i had an item on me so let's see oh i can't research anything on this character because i have it all okay so if i had found an item that i didn't already have researched i would be able to come in here right and click on that item and I would research the trade off of that item. But because this character has already researched every trait on every piece of gear, I can't really show that to you. But just know you click on this tab. So, for example, if your build calls for a Nern honed weapon, you would come in here, you would go to the weapons, you would go to the dagger, right? And you would get a Nern honed dagger. You would have it in your inventory. You would come here and you would click research. And then that would allow you to research the Nernhone trait off of that dagger that you probably just purchased off a guild trader. That's the easiest way to get Nernhone. Every other trait you can get real easily just by, you know, you'll go through dungeons and inevitably you'll pick up an item. You'll drop, you know, it'll drop powered. So you research powered on day one. And then on day two, you run a dungeon and it drops charged. So you research charged, right? Nernhone is the one that's like super rare. Uh, it's, it's hard to get. It only comes out of certain places like trials and stuff like that. So um, this one, the easiest thing to do is just go to a guild trader search for a low level white dagger with an earned on it you buy it for like uh, 18k 20k i'm not sure what the price is these days and then you just go back to your station you research it boom you it's a one-time cost now you have that trait you can reconstruct craft it forever and just to go over those crafting passives one more time for you because they are so important and i know it's confusing so the crafting passives you want to pay attention to are the ones that are called extraction well it's basically the bottom one and then the the one like two up from the bottom on every one if that's easier to remember so you've got temporary expertise metal extraction then you've got tannin expertise and unraveling right then you've got jewelry you've got plating expertise and jewelry extraction and then woodworking expertise extraction right it's almost always expertise and extraction you want those two before you start getting into crafting and refining just know that all right you want to get those done the other thing that you want to have before you start getting into crafting is uh, anytime you're going to uh, refine or deconstruct, it's beneficial to have meticulous disassembly uh, slotted. 
up here in your green notes. This is one I would honestly recommend any new player and even veteran player. You have this one slotted all the time. There's just so much money. All of these are kind of RP passives. This one is making you and saving you a ton of money just by having it slotted. So uh, it's one of those things that's just better to have slotted all the time because if you forget to slot it before you do a big crafting session or big refining session or something, you're losing a lot of money in the, as a result. And by having that CP node and um, this one slotted, you double your take. You're getting twice as many gold materials as you would by not having those slotted. Okay, so it literally it's a 100% increase in your return by having that passive and that CP node slotted. Very important. Can't emphasize it enough. All right, next up, let's talk about leveling in Elder Scrolls Online. How do you level in ESO? Well, that's a complicated answer and a not complicated answer at the same time, because Elder Scrolls Online is very much a not holding your hand type of game. unless you go and do whatever you enjoy doing. Now, there's certainly some things that are going to be much faster than others. There's certainly some things that are going to be much more profitable than others. There is no right or wrong way to level. Really, I highly encourage you to do the thing that's enjoyable to you and the levels will naturally come. I will say that questing is the slowest way to level and uh, grinding out XP in certain places in the game is the fastest way to level. Just going there and killing mobs over and over and resetting the instance and rinsing and repeating. I will link a power leveling guide in the description for you. That's going to go over all of the best and fastest ways to level. If you want to like skip the actual experience and you just want to get to the max level as soon as possible, you can do that. I don't recommend it. I don't think that's the best way to enjoy Elder Scrolls Online, but I know some of you don't care what I think is the best way to enjoy it. You just want to get to max level. And so don't worry, I've got you covered. I've got a guide for that, of course. But for those of you that want to level a little bit more naturally, what I would recommend doing is, you know, questing in your favorite area, doing at least one one random normal dungeon a day. That's going to give you 100,000 experience. This would take you from 10 to 13. That's three levels from one dungeon, right? It would also take you from 20 to 22, right? It's two levels. Uh, and the higher you get, the like the fewer levels that you get from doing a dungeon, right? But you're still going to get a substantial amount of experience. And then like later on, it's still giving you a full level just from doing one dungeon. That's pretty huge. And it's a great way to expedite your leveling. Just make sure you get your one random dungeon a day, if nothing else. And even if you're just questing, that's going to help get you to max level at a decent clip. You can also double dip on this XP by doing a random battleground. This gives you the same exact XP reward and you can do it once a day as well. Now battlegrounds will, well, your first time you're going to get curb stomp pretty bad. People are going to come in and probably wreck your face unless you happen to get lucky enough to get paired up against other people doing their first battlegrounds, which you know, that sometimes happens, but pretty rarely. So, you know, if you go in there and you take a lashing, you take a pretty good beating, don't feel bad. That happens to everybody the first time they go in there. Okay. But if your team gets second place or better, so first or second place out of the three teams in there, you get this experience. If your team gets third, you don't get the XP. You got to queue up again and do it until your team gets second or better. Okay. Just something to know about that reward. Just queuing up isn't enough. Your team has to get second or first. I have a complete leveling guide. I'm going to link that in the description as well. It's a leveling guide for one to 300. It tells you all the things you should do uh, at each level interval. So it'll say from one to 10, you should be doing these things from 15 to 20. You should be doing these things from, you know, 50 to 100. You should be doing this right. It's a very thorough leveling guide. If you're someone that's worried you're going to miss something important or do something wrong, I encourage you not to stress. Um, but, you know, if if you want to be sure, I have a guide for that. It's a complete leveling guide, one to 300, one of my most popular videos. So I'll link that in the description as well, in case you want to check that out. Now, there's another thing that I should mention now that I've talked about doing battlegrounds, and that is that in Elder Scrolls Online, there's really two types of content. Well, let's say there's three types of content in ESO. This is probably easier. There's your solo content, there is your group content, and then there's your PvP content. And each of these things requires slightly different builds in ESO. You could go into the PvP arenas with a group PvE build, but you're going to get absolutely smashed if you face a decent PvP, right? because he's going to be wearing PVP gear. PVP gear does really well in PVP content, but it does horribly in PVE content. And PVE gear does really good in PVE and it does horribly in PVP, right? So you can't use one build for everything in ESO. It just doesn't work that way. And the same thing, like if you take a group build into solo content, like a veteran solo arena, you know, you might not have the heals or the sustain most likely to really do very well in that content. So, you know, picking the right build for the type of content that you want to engage in is very important. I have a website that has solo builds and it has group builds and it even has some PVP builds if you're interested in that. So as always, I'll put a link to that down in the description below. Uh, just make sure that you kind of know what you want to do in ESO and just know that that build's going to have some limitations 
There's no such thing as a build that is really good at solo content, really good at group PVE content, and really good at PVP content. That just doesn't exist. Uh, you could do a PVE build and a PVP build, and I highly recommend that you, if you do that, you take advantage of the armory here. The armory is something that was recently added to ESO, and it's something that lets you switch between builds just like we're describing right now. So the armory lets you have, let's say, a Stamcrow PVP E build, right? And then a PVP build. You get to pick what it's called, the symbols are, right? You can edit it. So um, the way this works is you put your build together, you put it on your character, then you come here and then you click save build. And whatever you're wearing, it's going to put your gear, your food, your potions, it's going to put your Mundus, uh, your curse, whether you're werewolf, vampire, or neither. It's going to put your outfit, right? It's going to put your attributes, your slottables, your, your skills, your morphs, right? It's going to save the entire build right? All 64 of my stamina, right? And that way, this is my PVE build. So when I'm going to PVE, I click one button and boom, I'm ready to go for PVE. Okay. And then what if I want to do some PVP? And I was telling you, eh, this PVE build is going to crush in PVE content, but it's going to suck real horribly in PVP content. Let's be real. So then I come here before I go PVP and I click equip build. I load out my PVP build, right? And this is going to allow me to crush faces in PVP. So it's saved. You'll notice there's so many differences here, right? My PVP build is nothing like my PVE build. It's got way more defense. I've got points into health, something I would never do as a DPS in PVE content it's got a bit of stamina right some a healing ultimate on the back bar i mean this you would never put this in pve but in pvp you're forced to be your own tank your own healer and your own dps all in one package so it's uh, a little bit of everything on one build and that's what the armory station is for it's for making those big changes when you're going to change your build in a way that requires you you would have to respect multiple times right i would have to respect my cp i would have to respect my attributes i'd have to respect my morphs and my skills and i would have to change gear i would have to change my mundus uh my curse right all of this it would be such a pain to change all of this but now now it's one click because of the armory station. Great addition to the game. One caveat though, Zoss did over monetize this thing a little bit. So they give you two loadouts that you can use right here. You've got one and two for free. You get these two for free and then you could pay for additional slots, right? For 1500 crowns, not terribly cheap date. Okay. The thing about this is this is per character. So if you have 18 characters, just know that if you pay for this armory slot upgrade, it's only applying to the character you buy it on. So make sure one, you buy it on the right character and make sure two, that you know that the other 17 characters you have, you're going to have to buy that third slot one at a time on those characters if you're interested in engaging with that, which is where if you're on PC, you know, you can use an add on like Wizards Wardrobe. This is a free add on that you can download and it basically does the same thing as the armory, but without charging you and you can have infinite loadouts and not pay a dime. This existed before the armory, but Zoss added this so that console had this and then Zoss charged console for the extra slots. See, I can make infinite. <laughs> so, you know, just uh, I love I love ESO and I love a lot of things that Zoss has done with ESO, but I also hate the way that Zoss over monetizes and abuse console sometimes, you know, I just uh I'm going to keep this video positive, but that's just one of my little grievances there. So now, there is one difference, though, between Wizard's Wardrobe and the Armory. The Armory is going to change things that Wizard's Wardrobe won't. So the Armory is going to change your attributes. Wizard's Wardrobe cannot, right? You got to go to Shrine for that. And it's also going to change your Curse and your Mundus, right? These things. So those, it's there's a little bit of extra convenience because this Armory is able to do some stuff that your add-on isn't, all right? But... Like if you're just changing from one PVE build to another PVE build, this is the way to go. Use your wizard wardrobe for that. You can go from like an AOE build, to a single target build to a solo build, right? All of that because it's most, it's really just all going to be using the same curse or lack of, it's going to be using the same attributes. It's going to be using, you know, probably the same Mundus for most of that. So you don't need the armory slots is, is basically what I'm getting at. There's a way around spending all that money one character at a time. Next, I'm going to briefly go over what parsing is. You're going to hear people talk about parsing in ESO a lot. Parsing is how we determine how good our build is, how much damage we're doing with our build, right? So a lot of times you'll find a build that's posted on the internet by a very reliable source and, and you'll go try it out and it'll feel weak and you're not sure why or what's happening. Uh, and so it's likely going to be because you haven't parsed on it yet. You haven't practiced your rotation. You have not sat there and beat on one of these dummies like this guy right here or 
this one right here is the most common because it's been in the game the longest. So most, most people will have one of these in their house. So you have to buy one of these from the crown store. They are not free. And if you buy one or someone in your guild buys one, then you can come and parse on it and you just beat on it, right? You just beat on it and it's going to tell you at the end how much damage per second you did, right? It's going to spit out a number and it'll say, oh, you did 50,000 DPS or 100,000 DPS. And you'll know what level of content you are ready for. If you want to do normal content in ESO, there really is no DPS requirement. If you want to do veteran content like veteran trials in ESO, I would say 50 or 60,000 DPS minimum for veteran trials would be a pretty common ask. If you want to do veteran DLC trials, it's probably going to be more like 70 or 80,000 DPS minimum for ask. And if you want to do veteran DLC hard mode trials, they're probably going to be asking you to have well over 100,000 DPS on one of these parses, right? So it's a good way for you to come in. I would recommend coming in if you want to parsing every 50 or 100 CP as you're leveling up. So you can really see, oh man, my damage is actually going up considerably every time I come back here. And I promise you that the first time you parse, your damage will double just because you'll start to see how important it is to maintain dots. So uh, the biggest DPS loss in ESO for new players is going to be not maintaining dots, right? In ESO, you have basically, you have like, you have your spammable, sometimes a semi-spammable, right? But you have a spammable that you use anytime all your dots are ticking or your buffs, right? And then every other skill is a dot or a buff. So you have one spammable and then a dot or a buff as every other skill. So you're playing a little bit of a whack-a-mole here where you're trying to keep all those dots ticking. They all last between 10 and 30 seconds generally, and you keep reapplying them. And if they fall off, you go and reapply them. If you're all ticking, right, right, you reapply them on, then you've got five seconds until one of those buffs or dots falls off, then you can use your spammable five times, right? Or in the Necromancer's case, you'd use your spammable. And it, I don't want to get into rotations here because that's a whole nother bag of worms. Every one of my builds has its own rotation and I tell you what the rotation is in a really simple, easy to understand manner, hopefully. Yeah, I'm not going to get into the weeds of rotations, but just know the number one reason new players uh, struggle with their DPS is because they underestimate how important it is to make sure all of their dots are ticking at all times, right? Um, and light attacking between every single ability. When do you light attack? Between every ability. Who light attacks between every ability? Everybody. Literally everybody. Healers, DPS, and even tanks, although tanks are sometimes going to heavy attack instead of light attack between an ability. The reason we light attack between abilities is one, you're seeing all these effects trigger when I light attack him. That's proccing my enchant on my weapon. It's proccing my five piece set on my armor. It's proccing my other five piece set. That's that big stone that just came out of the ground, right? Light attacking does a lot of stuff. It's also, it's also when I light attack, see how my ult charge is at zero right now? See it's at zero. And if I light attack, well, let's first, if I use blast bones, it's still at zero, right? Using abilities does not make your ultimate charge. Very important to know. Very important to remember. Light attack. Now it's going up three, t three at a time. Okay. And it should be for nine ticks for a total of 27 ult charge. And there it goes, right? So every time you light attack, you get nine seconds of ult regen. It doesn't stack. You know, it's nine seconds from when you light attack. So you always want to make sure that you are light attacking between every ability for the damage, for the enchant procs, for the ult regen. There's a lot of benefits that come from light attacking between every single ability. It's just a part of ESO. It's something that every new player struggles with at first. It's really actually very simple. Don't overthink it. Don't overthink light attack weaving. And uh, that's what it's called. It is as simple as going light attack ability, light attack ability. It's just it's just a click between every skill. That's it. It's not complicated. It's not hard. It's just muscle memory. It's just something that you have to get used to. And people will tell you about animation canceling. That's literally just canceling the animation of your light attack. So this is a light attack without canceling the animation. Okay. It goes all the way around and then the arms come back and then he rests in front of him. So it starts, stops, right? I could do light attack animation, light attack animation. You don't even see the light attack happening anymore. You just see the scythe, right? But both are happening because I'm using the light attack and the scythe in near succession. So almost at the exact same time, I press light attack, but a fraction of a second later, I press the scythe. And I get credit for both because they technically have different cooldowns. The light attack has one cooldown. I can only light attack so fast. And the scythe has a one second global cooldown, just like all abilities do. So we do one light attack and one scythe per second. Anyway, we're getting into the weeds of parsing. Just know that that is light attack weaving. That is what parsing is. You use it to calculate your damage per second. And this tells you if 
one, your build is good, or two, you're good at a build. Like if you know your build's good and you want to know how good you are at using it, you come and you parse. If you're just going to do questing in ESO, if you're just going to do normal content, you don't have to worry about parsing. Uh, don't stress this. This is only for people that want to go into veteran, veteran DLC trials, that kind of thing. Next thing we're going to touch on briefly is Dark Anchors or Domen or Geysers or Dragons or Harrowstorms or Oblivion Gates. These are all the exact same thing. In Elder Scrolls Online, every zone has Dark Anchors or Domen. A Domen is kind of like the term. It's like a little world event that happens in random places around the world. It's usually denoted by this symbol right here. See this? It looks like the hurricane symbol on like a weather report. That right there. That is a dark anchor or a domain or whatever you want to call it. Every zone has a few different locations these can spawn. So this one has one here, here, and here. And only one can be active at a time. And when one is active, you'll see like two swords crossing over top of it, indicating, hey, this is the one that's active right now. And when you go to any zone, so if I go to this zone, it has a bunch of them, right? Right here, 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 here here, all over the place. Every zone has its own version. So in all the base game zones, it's these dark anchors that fall from the sky. And then in all of the chapters, they have their own iteration of that. Here it's volcanic vents. In Somerset, it's these geysers that shoot water out of the ground, right? It's always a different thing depending on which chapter it is, but it's also the same thing in a way. It's an event where everybody congregates and like takes it down. Uh, they can all be soloed. They're all pretty easy to do. They can be soloed by just about anybody, except maybe Greymore. Greymores can be kind of dis difficult to solo, probably, uh, especially for a new player. Domen to be aware of, though, is the ones in Alakir Desert. These stand out above the rest for one reason. I'll teleport there real quick to show you why. OK, so in new. Uh, so here's the you can see this is the active one right now, which means this will probably be the next active one that I'm at. I'm guessing it's going clockwise. It can change but right now. It appears to be going clockwise. So in a moment, you'll see this crowd of people. This crowd is going 24, 7, 7, you know, it's like seven days a week, all day, every day. The, there is always the Alakir Domen. People come here and lose their souls. You have to be careful about doing the Alakir Domen. It can be a very effective way to level. It doesn't require you to have any gear. It's the Netflix and chill way to level in ESO. Like if you just want to get passive experience without turning your brain on, without having any good gear, this is where it is. So here they come as predicted, right? They're all spawning in. You'll see a lot of people come. And they're all running up to do this Domen event up here, which we should be able to see spawning in any second. Let's go up and I'll show you what that looks like. OK, there it is. It's spawning in. These big anchors come down from the sky. The sound is so awesome on this. Boom, there comes the anchor. That's why it's called a dark anchor. And it's uh, it's just going to drop a bunch of enemies down on the ground. Everybody's going to go. They're going to kill those enemies. And uh, you don't get very much experience for killing anything in there. The most of the experience comes from the end when you kill the final boss and the event is over. This quote unquote event is over and you get this bulk of XP after the event is over. It's like 5000 XP without really any buffs, something like that. And then you move on to the next one, right? And so they're going to kill this one until the final boss uh, spawns and then they'll kill that boss and then they'll teleport to this one right here. They'll teleport to this. Go here. Now let's teleport to this and go here, right? If you're ever curious about the Domen farm, I have a guide on ESO.justluta.com that tells you just search for Lucky Ghost Domen Guide or whatever, you know, and you will find that. So there's the boss. They're melting it, right? There's so many people here. It goes so fast, which is why this is such good XP early on. There's a lot of ways to level that are faster than Domen. There's none that are easier because it doesn't require you to do anything other than tag one enemy one time. And that gives you credit for the Domen and you can move on to the next one. It's that easy. Now there they go. And like I said, this is going 24 seven all day, every day. Be careful with these. I've seen a lot of people basically come and get addicted to these because it's so easy and so effective and uh, they never go play the rest of the game. And then they, they one day burn out and they get bored and they wonder why. And it's because they were just running from Domen to Domen, killing these things over and over for like three weeks and uh, <laughs> then just burned out on the game. All right. So be careful with those. They're effective, but you know, be careful. All right, next up, let's talk about the justice system in Elder Scrolls Online. So in Elder Scrolls Online, you can steal from people. You can thieve, right? But if you get caught, like if you fail, like so if I come up behind this person, I have a chance. It says 100% chance to pickpocket them. So I do, right? And I get the item down there in the bottom right. You'll see I can steal from a person three times before their pockets are empty. Each time that you steal from the same person, your chance of succeeding generally gets lower. Although some NPCs are super basic and you have a great chance of succeeding. Generally, the higher the chance of succeeding, the worse the loot is going to be from that NPC. Now, 
if I were to get caught, like if a guard was walking by and saw me steal from this person, he would get mad. Or if I attack this person, like I'm going to do right now, I am now notorious. Down here, you can see my bounty. So if, if a guard comes up to me or if I walk by a guard, he's going to say, hey, halt, you just broke the law, right? Because I just killed this civilian. I one I stole from her, but I didn't get a bounty for that because I didn't get caught. And then I murdered her. So now I'm going to walk by this guard to show you what happened. It's not really a big deal if you get caught for it. You just have to pay the 138 gold. And the big thing is that they'll take from you anything that you have on you that was stolen. So if you've been doing a lot of thieving, like if you just were stealing from a town for an hour, you don't want to get caught, right? Because you'll lose all that hard work before you get a chance to go and sell it. So if I talk to this, if I walk by this guy, he'll be like, hey, right? And I have the option to pay and he'll take all the stolen goods off of me. I can I can use clemency, which is one of my passives from my thieving line, I, uh, which, you know, Actually, I'll do that, right? I'm going to do that. So he would have just taken the gold from me and the 83 gold that I owed, and he would have taken the items. But I could have come to the Outlaw Refuge. Outlaw Refuge is this symbol right here. After you steal, you can come in here and you go to the fence and then you come in here, talk to the fence. And the first thing they're going to say is, I will not buy anything from you if you have a bounty. I have a 23 gold bounty left, right? So it's like I have some passives that reduce that. So that's why it's less than what it says. Okay, yeah, here. There's 14 gold. Now I'm saying, I got some goods, man. I want to sell these to you. He's like, sure, I'll pay 110 gold for that. Okay. And I'm selling it to him. I could also launder it. So if I wanted, if it was an item, like let's say I got a furnishing recipe that was really valuable, or I got something that was actually valuable and I wanted to keep it, I could launder it, which means I pay him 100 gold. He gives it back to me and I get to keep it in my inventory. When you sell it to the fence, it's gone and it's gone forever. There's no buyback when you sell to the fence. So be careful in here. Don't accidentally sell something that you wanted to keep. And just know that if it says treasure, see in the top left of the corner there, if it says treasure, it's garbage. Treasure in ESO is meant for one thing and one thing only. It is to be sold to NPCs for the gold value of that treasure. So this one is worth 100 gold. I'd sell it for 100 gold. I have some passives that make it so that I get more than 100 gold when I sell to the fence. Apparently a 10% bonus, right? There's passives in the uh, passive line for thieving. There's also passives in your CP tree that would actually make this a lot more that I don't currently have slotted right now. So this is going for for 110 gold and if we slot that passive increase fence values okay so we'll put this on confirm the changes always remember to confirm changes all right and then we talk to the fence it was selling for 110 now it sells for 135 oh you know if you're gonna do some thieving just make sure that you go ahead and go to the green tree and slot your thieving ones you want to slot cut purse this is going to give you higher quality items and slot infamous. This is going to give you 25% more. And if you have, I've done a lot of testing on this. I sold a, there's a, there's an achievement where you have to steal a million gold worth of items selling them to this fence. It's literally, it's 100 to like 300 gold at a time, basically up to 1 million in gold in stolen goods. That achievement was not quick and easy to get. That took me a while. And uh, so I was able to do some tests. And what I found out was when you have this cut purses art and this infamous, it works out to exactly double the profits from your thieving. Exactly double. So if I was going out and getting 10K every time I filled up my inventory with stolen goods, when I slotted these two, I would get 20K every time I went out and filled out my inventory with stolen goods. It was exactly double. So that must have been their plan when they set these two up is like, all right, we want to we want to make it so that when they slot both of these, they make literally exactly twice what they would normally make because that's what it worked out to. And I tested it a bunch of times. So make more money, you know, double your income by slotting those two anytime you're thieving. All right, the next thing I'm going to touch on real quickly is force picking locks. This is a question I get a lot when people are watching me stream ESO. I'll be streaming the game and then I'll walk up to a chest and I'll open it immediately. And they're like, wait a second. How did you skip the lock picking minigame? Normally you have to come in here and you have to push this down. And as soon as it starts vibrating, you let go. Right? You just watch it and you just let go. Right. And you get to the last one. Same thing. I'm not going to do it right now. So I can show you the alternative option, which is down here at the bottom. It says force lock 85% chance. I can just walk up to a chest and press R and force pick the lock. Now I have an 85% chance to succeed at that because I maxed out ledger domain. So if we go down here to ledger domain right here, we see locksmith improves your chances of forcing locks by 70%. So that this lock would have been 15%, but because of this passive, it's now 85, right? So normally you would fail and you would fail a lot trying to do this, but ledger domain lets me, right? And how do you level up ledger domain? You level up ledger domain by selling stolen goods like we did a moment ago. Okay, so if we come here and we do uh, chance and I just press R, boom. 
it opens up. I don't have to play that mini game. And the mini game is fine and all, but after you've done it a million times, you're going to want to just get through it fast, especially if you're in a dungeon, there's people waiting on you. Most likely, if you don't have the force pick unlocked, they will, and they'll be standing there like, why did this guy open it? Why didn't he just let me open the chest? I could open it real quick, and we could be on our way to killing the next set of mobs. And get this passive whenever you get a chance. It's not super urgent. It's not a big deal. I mean, if you have to manually unlock chests in a dungeon, it's not the end of the world by any means, or out in the open world. Some people even enjoy the minigame, but I personally think it's a fantastic one to have on hand. It's super convenient and a little known thing the in ESO. A lot of people overlook this. They don't know it's there. All right, next, let's talk about housing. And you may not have known it, uh, but much of this video has been taking place in my house. This island is actually my house. One of the things that ESO does better than any other game, bar none, is housing. And this whole island, my volcano, my island, my resorts, uh, the stages over there, these stations, right? It's a bit of a mess right now because I've moved around things a lot lately ever since. Uh, well, this is my house, this whole island, and I've got other houses all over the world. You can tell where the houses are located because of these little houses on the map. These are the ones I don't own. And if you see one that is white, well, the one I'm in, or this one right here, it's kind of hidden. Uh, this one right here, that's one I own, right? So I own a ton of houses. ESO has a ton of houses that you can buy for gold. The best houses will be bought in the crown store for as much as $100. So there's some good sides and bad sides to the ESO housing. But the cool thing is just how insanely awesome the housing system is and how much it lets you customize it. I mean, if you go into my island house, it will look nothing like someone else's island house and it will not that will look nothing like someone else's. You can do some pretty cool things in here. I've seen some pretty cool creations and really impressive to see what people have done with housing in ESO. So you get a super basic house right when you start the game you'll be in town and there'll be a quest to like get your basic in-house go ahead and grab that it's nice you can teleport back to it for free and it's located in town like this was my first house the saint delen penthouse it's like literally a six by six room that i could store a few of my most basic things in i didn't have much at that point so it, i mean it was big enough it wasn't fancy but it got the job done eventually i moved into something like this and when you are in your house to move things around, just press F5 or the button that shows up down here if you're on console. Here's F5. And then I can browse all of the goods in my inventory or that I own. And I can put these in the house like this little imp guy and set him here. Right. It's literally unlimited what you could do almost. Uh, the housing system is so impressive in ESO. In order to buy a house, generally speaking, you just walk up to it. You try to enter it and it'll say do you want to purchase this house? If you can't purchase it with gold, it'll tell you how much it costs to buy in crowns. Some of them are locked behind achievements. Some are not. There's uh, some really nice houses you can buy for gold and that are like the faction achievement homes, stuff like that. They cost like 3 million, 3.5 million gold and stuff all the way down to just a few thousand gold. So, you know, do some research, do some shopping and pick the one that looks cool to you. Next up, I'm going to quickly talk about add ons. Add ons are something that you can use on PC. There are no add ons on console. Unfortunately, add ons are incredibly powerful and an insanely. I mean, I don't know if I could play the game without them anymore. I've I've had them for so long. I've been spoiled by the the amount of quality of life that they provide. You may notice that my UI looks very different than yours, especially like uh, my inventory. It's all sorted and neat and nice and modern looking uh, compared to like the base game UI. And that's all all because of my add-ons, right? It's all doing that. It's all changing the way that everything looks for me uh, and bringing it a little bit into the modern age, in my opinion. I really like my add-ons. And the thing about the add-ons is I recommend downloading a program called Minion. I have a whole add-ons guide that goes into much more detail about getting add-ons, installing add-ons. But the best thing about Minion is that you can, once they're installed, you just click update all every patch and it updates them like that for you. And one of my most popular guides is my add-on guide. So be sure to check that out. Link in the description below. Some really, really fantastic add-ons by some fantastic add-on authors out there. Definitely recommend taking advantage of them if you can, if you're on PC. They're going to do things like tell you the value of items when you hover over them. They're going to do things like sort your inventory or auto sell junk when you talk to NPCs. They're going to warn you of mechanics if you're trying to learn a dungeon. Like they're very powerful add-ons. They do so much good stuff. Next, let's talk about companions. So first, let's go over the companions that were added with Blackwood. In Blackwood, there are two companions added to the game, Ember, and Bastion. Ember can be collected by heading up north to the Doom Vault Volpinas, and Bastion can be collected by heading down south in the zone of Blackwood to Deep Scorn Hollow. If you go there, you'll find Bastion tied up. You start a quest with him. Likewise, if you go up to the Doom Vault, you'll find Miri up here. So she is a dark elf. He is an imperial. She's kind of uh, she's kind of like fun. Not really. She's pretty critical, but not too bad. Bastion is a whiner. Uh, he complains a lot. He doesn't like cheese, and he's going to tell you every time 
that you touch something that he doesn't like. She doesn't like when you pick up fireflies. That's her big thing. And there, you don't realize how often you accidentally pick up fireflies in this game until you are carrying her around and she's constantly complaining about it. So those two companions, if you want the like sassy dark elf, that's her. If you want the whiny Imperial, that's him. Fortunately, in the next chapter, after that one, right? So that was Blackwood. And the next chapter, which was High Isle, they added two more companions. These are significantly better in terms of their personalities. Functionality wise, they're all the same. They all perform just as well as the other. They're all based on a class. So, you know, every class in ESO can be a tank healer or DPS. So every companion can be a tank healer or DPS. It's really just about how you set them up. In my opinion, High Isle has the best companion, which is going to be Ember. And she's collected uh, here at the Tor Dryok, this little castle looking thing. Come here, find her and start a quest with her. And that's going to unlock her. She's the best companion, Barna. She's the happiest, spunkiest. She's just in a good mood. She puts you in a good mood with some of the stuff she says. She'll, you know, get gleefully excited about every little thing you do. And, uh, you know, she's just kind of fun to have around. She brightens the mood a lot when you're traveling around, especially when you compare her to the other companions that, I don't know, Zoss tried to make them realistic. They tried to give them uh, likes and dislikes. And what ended up happening with the rest is they spend a lot of time complaining because all their dislikes are happening constantly throughout the game. Like if you're doing a little bit of thieving they get mad at you if you eat cheese they get mad at you if you pick a firefly you get mad at you if you do anything in the game like there's some you're constantly doing something where they're complaining whereas ember she's just go with the flow man the only time she gets mad at you is if you're fishing which i don't do a lot of anyway or if uh she catches like if you get caught thieving like she's cool with you thieving she gets excited she's like yeah let's go uh but if you get caught she'll be like oh i'm disappointed eh? i thought you were better than that so and then over here you've got castle navir and that's where you would unlock isabel she's kind of like your knight in shining armor um she's not nice. She's in a better mood than say the two companions from Blackwood, but she is also a little bit of a complainer, you know, so she's like Bastion 2.0. Basically, she's similar personality to Bastion, but complains a little bit less than Bastion. Um, but yeah, Ember is a Khajiit and she is a Breton. My vote, if you're going to pick up a companion, go to Tordrag, pick up Ember and never look back. Dude, she's the best one by far. Companions do about nine to 10,000 DPS. So that's about the damage you're going to be doing on day one as a level one noob. And they don't really ever get better than that. So they're just meant to be a little personality that follows you along. There's a little bit of a progression system. You can put gear on them. It's companion specific gear that drops. Uh, let's see. Let me go out and open up my companion menu so you can see what that's like. So if we summon my favorite companion here, don't mind her outfit. Chat made me do it. OK, she's dressed just like me. OK, and that was I promise that wasn't my idea, you know humiliating for her so companion menu we can see like right here is all the gear you can put on your companion so i've got some blue some green i didn't spend a lot of time upgrading her gear because uh frankly her dps is so small compared to mine and i am not i'm bragging or anything like that like um she's there for the personality she's not there for the damage that's that's basically what it is but if you're a brand new player or if you're a tank or you're a healer that doesn't do a lot of dps um the damage that they provide can be helpful uh, and then here you can change their skills. You go to the skills menu by clicking skills, and then you can drag these on here as you unlock them. Um, guild, you can drag the guild skills on here. You level up the guilds by doing guild quests. So if you go do a fighter's guild daily, it levels up your fighter's guild or your companion. Just make sure that your companion is out when you turn in the fighter's guild daily, and that levels up fighter's guild on your companion. Okay, very important. Same with major's guild, same with undaunted guild. Just do the dailies, but have the companion out when you turn them in. And then that's going to level up the companion's skill lines. You can dress your companion. You can either put custom costumes on them by going to an outfit station and editing their outfit there. Or you can just put, if you don't have like an outfit that you want to put on them, you can just do this and you can put one of your costumes that you have on them. If you've dyed this costume for yourself, it'll be dyed when they put it on the same exact way you had it. Uh, you can also pick the mount that they have. So when you get on your mount, they will also get on the mount that you choose. So I have her on that mount and I'm on this one. OK, the last thing that you can look at is the equipment. So if I had some companion equipment, it would be like right there. Right. And I could be like, oh, I got a companion belt. Put it here. Currently, if you have any companion equipment, it's taking up your inventory space until you put it on your companion. So you don't want to run around with like a bunch of companion equipment that you don't need. Go ahead and sell it if you don't need it, because it'll be just clogging up your limited inventory space. So, you know, occasionally put your best equipment on her and sell the rest. Another cool thing that was added to Elder Scrolls Online was the Seals of Endeavor system. I touched on it a little bit earlier when I was talking about crates, but we can go more in depth right now. So the Seals of Endeavor was added as a way for you to get the really, really cool mounts like 
for instance, the one I'm on right now, I bought this with Seals of Endeavor. This is my Material Inspired Mount for my Material Inspired Outfit. Uh, it just looks absolutely stunning. And I got this without paying a dime. I got this by doing the Seals quest in the game. Now, it does unfortunately take 10 to 12 months of doing the dailies to unlock said mount or mounts like it. Zoss is, you know, they didn't make it easy, but it's better than not having any way at all. To find out what the seals of Endeavor dailies are, you just open up the group menu with P on your keyboard, or if you're on console, this button up here, the little people, right? And then you click Endeavors. You can do three daily endeavors per day, and you can do one weekly endeavor per week. <laughs> People found me. You come in here, the three weekly options are, it gives you options. So if you're a PvP, it says you can go to Battlegrounds. If you're a PvE, -er, you can kill 75 dangerous foes or complete two arenas. Really, they give you three options, but you can only get credit for one. So I'd be able to get 225 from here. And then I'd be able to do three of these at 15 a pop, any three that I chose, right? So I could read two lore books or I could enchant three pieces of equipment. And then there's always a PVP one for the PVPers or a crafting one for crafters, right? So they try to have something in here for everyone. If you're curious about how many seals you have and how much it costs to buy something, down here at the bottom, you have the seals of Endeavor Store. The seals of Endeavor Store holds the same items as the current set of crown crates. So crown crates last two to three months, something like that. And these items, so these are what's in the crown crates that you would have to gamble for, probably $400 and beyond for these mounts, right? Uh, or if you've been saving up seals for 10 to 12 months, you could come in here, seals, and go to the crown crates and go to the radiant apex and boom, 16,000 seals to buy these things. And currently I have 4,000 seals. So it looks like it's going to be another eight months or so before I can do this, right? If, if I do my quest every single day. Day. Uh, it takes a while and it takes a lot of commitment to get these things without paying big bucks, but at least the option is there. Next, let's talk about another new feature that was added semi recently, and that is curated loot. So curated loot is not really something that you see in game. It's not a window we can open up as much as it is. Well, it kind of is. So curated loot is a new loot table that ESO implemented that says if a boss can drop an item that you have not collected in your sticker book yet, it will drop that item. So if I go run this trial again and I get a drop, the boss is guaranteed not to give me this coral riptide ring because I already have it. It'll give me one of the weapons or one of the pieces of jewelry or one of the pieces of armor, one of the things I don't have yet. So the important thing to know about ESO loot tables in dungeons and trials is the first few bosses in a dungeon or a trial only drop armor unless it's a named item that's a super weird quirky thing named items don't perform any better than any other items it's just like sometimes a weapon will drop on the first boss and it'll have like a weird name attached to it and it doesn't perform any better it's not any different from any other weapons it's just got a name on it and it happens to drop from the first boss instead of the last boss but typically only the last boss will drop weapons and jewelry so you'll have to kill the last boss in a dungeon to have a chance at the weapon or jewelry that you need from that boss or from that dungeon whereas the first three or four bosses leading up to that boss they're all going to drop the armor pieces so you're always going to fill out your armor pieces really fast because all of the bosses leading up to the final boss drop armor right and there's only a few armor pieces but then you have a ton of weapons and jewelry and these only drop from the final boss so this is where the time comes in the time sink for filling out a set it's uh killing the final boss of the dungeon the x factor is every time you open a chest in a dungeon it could drop any item from that dungeon so a chest if you find a chest in the dungeon it could drop a amulet it could drop a helmet it could drop a weapon the chest doesn't have a limited loot table and it's also it doesn't take advantage of curated loot so it could also drop you an item you already have so the chest is kind of like the it does what it wants it drops anything it wants it doesn't care about your loot table it doesn't care about curated loot and it doesn't care what bosses drop it's just going to drop any item from that dungeon right whereas the bosses uh, only the last boss is going to drop these things so curated loot says when you get to the last boss he's going to drop one of the weapons or jewelry that you don't have and same with the bosses leading up to him which is why it's important when you're going through a dungeon on the first time you bind every piece of gear that you get as you get it this prevents the next boss from dropping that same piece of gear that way you don't get two chest pieces in a row like you kill one boss he drops the chest and if you don't bind that to yourself the next boss could drop that same chest so you gotta open your inventory right click the item bind it see that option right there just click bind and then boom you've bound that item to yourself no boss will drop that for you again until you've collected every other item that that boss can drop and then he'll just start dropping anything again 
It'll just be random loot. But the game is basically trying to help you fill out your collection as fast as possible. That is curated loot. That's what people refer to when they say curated loot. It's a relatively new feature in ESO. It was a great quality of life addition. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is Tales of Tribute. This is the thing that was added with High Isle. It's a card game, mini game, but it's not that mini game. These card games last between 15 and 20 minutes. But if you're the type of player that enjoys card games, you might really enjoy Tales of Tribute. So it's worth checking out. It's worth trying just in case you enjoy it. To pick up Tales of Tribute, you go to this symbol right here in the zone of High Isle. So here's the zone of High Isle. Then you have the town of Ganfallon Bay. Then the very southern part on this little peninsula right here, you have this building. So you go over here, you pick up the Tales of Tribute quest. There will be a tutorial attached. It's a fun little thing. You try that out and learn how to play Tales of Tribute. There can be some decent rewards and some decent achievement rewards from doing this. Let's talk about how to buy the game, just in case you haven't done that yet. If you have, feel free to skip this section using the timestamps below. Elder Scrolls Online is available on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. On PC, you can either buy the game from Steam or you can buy it from the Elder Scrolls Online website and use their launcher. There's no difference between the two versions of the game, so feel free to use either one. It doesn't really matter, honestly. The upside of buying it from Steam is that you don't have to log in and use your password every day. The upside of buying it from Sauce is that if Steam does go down, you will still have to use your password every day, but you'll still be able to get into the game. There's usually going to be two versions of the game available for you to buy, and depending on whether or not ESO is on sale, it's usually going to be going for between $5 and $20 for the base game, around $5 when it's on sale, and around $20 when it's not for the base game. Elder Scrolls calls its expansions chapter. So whenever you hear someone talking about a chapter, they're talking about an expansion. So if they say the newest chapter was awesome, they're talking about the newest expansion. So one of the things you have to decide when you're buying is if you want to own all of the expansions or not. If you buy the newest expansion or the newest chapter, then you'll own all of the chapters or all of the expansions up to that point. And when you buy that in combination with the base game, that's usually going to run you around $60 if nothing's on sale. Just to clarify, this is not the same as including all of the DLC of which there are a ton. There are four pieces of content released every year. There's two dungeon DLCs. Each one has two dungeons and there's two zone DLCs. One of those zone DLCs is the expansion the, or the chapter as ESO calls it. And the other DLC is a zone DLC. Usually the way it works is the first quarter is two dungeons. The second quarter is the expansion. If you buy Elder Scrolls Online and you buy the newest chapter so that you own all of the chapters or all of the expansions, you still won't own any of the DLC dungeons or any of the DLC zones. That accounts for roughly half of the game or more these days. So in order to have access to all of that content, what you're going to need to do is subscribe to ESO Plus, the optional subscription for Elder Scrolls Online. So what is ESO Plus? Well, it's going to include full access to all of the DLCs, which is what I just started touching on. It's going to give you unlimited storage for your crafting materials. This is the crafting bag, and this is the major thing that everyone talks about ESO Plus being worth it. It's the fact that you don't have this inventory struggle all the time when you're playing the game. If you're really enjoying ESO, then ESO Plus is almost certainly going to be worth it because it's going to make it so that you're not spending your whole play session managing your inventory. There's over 500 different ingredients. These stack into the thousands when you have ESO Plus. And without ESO Plus, these are going to be clogging up your banks, your alts, like your main character's inventory. It's going to be a lot of work to manage them. It's possible, but it is a lot of work. ESO Plus is also going to give you crowns every month that you can use in the crown store to buy any of the stuff that is in there. It's also going to give you double the bank space for your account. So even more inventory, your bank space is going to go up from 240 to 480. It's going to give you increased gold and experience by 10%. It's going to give you increased crafting inspiration and trait research by 10%. These are small things, but they're nice to have. I mean, 10% faster leveling is, you know, that's great. 10% extra gold isn't a big deal. You don't gain most of your gold from drops. So that 10% gold isn't really, eh, it's nothing to write home about. 10% uh, increased crafting and inspiration. It's going to give you double furnishings and collectibles. So if you get into housing, this is going to allow you to put twice as many furnishings and collectibles in your house. That's going to be fantastic. It's going to give you the exclusive ability to dye costumes. So in the game, you're going to be able to dye your outfits no matter what. But there's a separate thing called a costume. This is an entire ensemble that you can buy from the cash shop. And if you buy one of these without ESO Plus, you can't dye it. If you do buy it, then there's three different dye slots that you can select. It's all very basic and you won't spend a lot of time wearing costumes, most likely. 
and you won't spend a lot of time dying costumes. But if you have ESO Plus, you'll have the ability to do that. Just know that without ESO Plus, you can still dye your normal outfits, which is what you'll be wearing most of the time once you get going in the game and you have a ton of motifs, as we call them in ESO, which is the same thing as a transmog if you came from WoW or your glamour dresser if you're coming from Final Fantasy 14. You're also going to have double the currency cap for transmute crystals. So transmute cap is going to go from 500 to 1000 for you. Massive. And you're also going to have exclusive access to unique crown store deals. This is nice. It's not selling you things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to buy, but it's giving you these things at a slight discount. Again, the major reason for getting ESO Plus is the crowns every month, the double bank space, the unlimited crafting bag and access to all of the DLC packs. Remember, this is right here. This first thing, this is half the game. You either have this with ESO Plus or you don't without it. It's worth mentioning that you can choose to buy these DLC packs individually one piece at a time and never sub to the game. So you would eventually own the entire game if you buy it all one piece at a time, but you still wouldn't have this unless you get ESO Plus. So that's always an option for you if you don't like having a subscription in a video game. So what's the deal on ESO Plus? Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? In my opinion, if you're enjoying the game, it's 100% worth it. It gives you so much quality of life. It makes your inventory a lot more fun to deal with and it unlocks all of the best content in the game. So if you're enjoying the game, it's absolutely worth it. But if you can't afford it or if you just don't like paying a sub, you can still enjoy a lot of what ESO has to offer without it. The next thing we'll talk about is the crown store or this game's version of a cash shop. A lot of people want to know before they jump into a game whether it is pay to win or not. In my opinion, ESO is not pay to win in a way that will negatively impact your experience. No one can go into the cash shop and buy gear. Everyone has to go into the dungeons and into the trials and farm that stuff themselves. You can use the cash shop to expedite your progress, however, and you can also use the cash shop primarily more than anything else to get cosmetics. You can buy outfits like this armor pack here and you can open it up and you can view the things and see what they look like on your character, you know, or you can buy a hat. <laughs> different holiday hats, little things like that. It's mostly cosmetic stuff. It also has ground crates. This is ESO's gambling mechanic. If you're someone who likes to gamble in your video game with real life cash, then these crown crates are for you. Just buyer beware. These crown crates have really, really, really low drop rates. So most people buy these crown crates hoping to get one of these mounts. These mounts are often going to cost you $400 or more if you're trying to get one of these. That's how low the drop rates are. It's below half a percent chance to drop one of these bad boys, right? It's really, really low. And so it's really, really expensive to get one. So if you buy these crates, don't expect to be getting these things. It's much more likely you're going to be getting the stuff down here, which is going to be little cosmetic things, maybe some pets, maybe a piece of armor. And very, very likely you're going to get things like this, like these dyes or these poisons or round mimic stones. You know, these are the most common things you get all the way down here. So just buy or beware, gamble responsibly. I can't emphasize this enough. It's very, very, very unlikely. I'm talking $400 and beyond unlikely that you are going to get that sweet radiant apex mount at the top there, you know, so don't fall for these crates. Don't let your friends fall for these crates. Be careful if you're spending your money on these crates. Just know the odds are very, very much stacked against you. And you're looking at possibly spending $400 and beyond to get that mount that you want. If you're going to be upset that you spent $400 getting a mount, it might be best not to try to get one of them. But again, on the bright side, this crown store is mostly cosmetic. It's not a pay to win cash shop where people can come in here and directly buy power that nobody else can have access to. Nobody's going to be able to come into the cash shop and get stronger than somebody that is not using the cash shop. Uh, you do not need to worry about that type of pay to win in Elder Scrolls Online. All right, guys, that is it. If you are still here, let me know down in the comments below that you made it all the way to the end of this incredibly long video. I promise you, as long as it took you to watch, it took me five times as long to record. I have been recording this thing all day long and I still have to edit. Oh my God. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found this thing to be incredibly useful. Always remember that you can refer back to it. Just open up the timestamps in either the comment or the description down below. Hit control F and just type the name of the topic you want to search for, whether it's leveling, whether it's refining materials, retrading gear, trials, respects, sky shards, right? You just control F and then click on that timestamp and it takes you right to my video explanation of what that is, how it works and how to take advantage of it. You know, this is going to be a great resource for you to open up and use anytime you run into something you don't fully understand in Elder Scrolls Online. And thank you so, so much for watching and listening. I hope that you found this thing 
enjoyable and at least informative. And uh, like I said, if you're still here, dude, if through all of this, I hope you leave a comment. Let me know what you thought and if you enjoyed it. If you ever want to hang out with someone else that loves MMOs, be sure to swing by my Twitch stream over at twitch.tv slash lucky ghost, where you'll find me playing ESO and other MMOs. If you ever have questions about ESO, you can always ask me there whether or not I'm playing the game. Be sure to use my site. I put a lot of work into it and I've had a lot of great people help me build a great resource for all ESO players, veterans and new players alike. If you're looking for guides to help you get better, if you're looking for build guides, whatever it is, take advantage of that resource. You won't regret it. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel if you found this video enjoyable or helpful. I put out tons of ESO and MMO content like this. And a massive, massive shout out to my YouTube members who support the channel in a big way. If you want to support the channel, be sure to click the join button down below where you'll not only help me out, but you also get behind the scenes footage, my thoughts on the future of the channel, and exclusive access to a members only Discord channel where you'll always have my ear. Thanks for watching. And if you're not sure what to do next, be sure to check out one of the videos popping up on screen right now.